<coughs> Good evening, and welcome to the November 16th meeting of the Scarborough Planning Board. Will we all rise to pledge allegiance to the flag, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Karen, you want to read the roll call, please? Ms. Auglis? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Fellows? Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. DuPont? Mr. Wood? Here. Okay, in light of the fact that we have two members absent this evening. Ms. Oglis and Mr. Bealey will be voting members t tonight for the record. The first agenda item is approval of the minutes of October 26th. Do I hear a recommendation? I'll move to approve the minutes. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, let me set up the next three agenda items. <coughs> I'm going to read them all as one, uh, and the town planner will then address each of them. After that is done, I will open it up to the public on each of these three items for any public discussion. Uh, if you wish to speak on any of these three items, I ask that you Keep your uh, comments down to five minutes, and that uh, we not hear the same comments by different people. Let's try and get through these as quickly as possible, but at the same time giving everyone an opportunity to express their opinions. Having said that, oh yes, and can I just remind me, when you do come up, give us your name and address, please. Thank you. Let me read the three agenda items that are related. The Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive input regarding the proposed amendments to Zoning Ordinance Chapter 405 to add the Higgins Beach character-based co code. Second, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough Official Zoning Map to, to delineate the Higgins Beach character districts. Third, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405C, the Town of Scarborough Sh Shoreline Zoning Ordinance, to address the development coverage allowance in the Higgins Beach area. Uh, before I turn it over to the Town Planner, I would like to say that this, the result of all of this is due to some work that was done by the planning staff, a consultant, and a long-range planning committee uh, and coming up with, uh, and working with, by the way, the Higgins Beach neighborhood residents and property owners to come up with these uh, proposals. Uh, and so <coughs> hopefully we can have an open discussion as to what they had decided and recommended. With that, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Planning Board members and members of the public. Um, I'm Dan Bacon, uh, the Planning Director, and I'm going to walk through a presentation, uh, as Mr. Mazur indicated, on, on all three uh, matters that are before the Planning Board for public hearing. Um, and, um, but if there are specific questions about any one of them, I can answer them under each, each agenda item. Um, and so what we're presenting this evening is uh, what's being called Higgins Beach Code Repair. Uh, we've been, as Mr. Mazur indicated, the Long Range Planning Committee, planning staff, our consultant, uh, the Higgins Beach Association, and a lot of the Higgins Beach residents and property owners have been looking at this for quite some time. Uh, we conducted a, a three-day uh, neighborhood charrette uh, design process back in June. Um, spent the summer working on a, a draft code uh, in response to what we heard and the discussions we had back in June. In September, we, we had a follow-up neighborhood meeting uh, at the clubhouse at Higgins Beach to um, present a, a rough working draft of the code and since have been refining it to what's before you this evening. The council's also had a, a workshop in October and they've had first reading and they'll be having their public hearing 
uh, this Wednesday. So two, two nights from tonight um, at 7 o'clock, they'll also be having a public hearing. And so this all originated um, really out of a request from the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals for the last 10, 15 years has seen a lot of requests for variances at Higgins Beach really because the zoning is out of step with uh, the lot sizes at Higgins Beach, the placement of houses at Higgins Beach, and the desire at Higgins Beach for people to be adding on, to be taking down old cottages and building new cottages and new houses. And with the current zoning, that really can't happen in a, in a practical, reasonable way. Additions can't happen because the setbacks are too great on the front side or rear. Um, and uh, essentially, you know, development can't happen without zoning board approval or additions that happen in kind of an awkward way. This is a, and I apologize for the monitors being a bit off in color, but this shows a legal addition at Higgins Beach um, where a property owner wanted to expand. They likely probably would want to expand at the first floor, but given setbacks, they added a, a third yeah, floor. Let me interrupt you there. Sure. I, is there two, two, mm -hmm. There's a monitor behind this one that faces you. In that one, yep. so some of the people right here, you may either want to turn around or move back so that you get a good view of, of what Dan is referring to. Right. Sorry to interrupt you, but there were people that I yeah. noticed that. Thanks for that. Um, for some reason that monitor is not operating this evening. Yeah, so that's why. Uh, mm. So really, for the last 30 or 40 years, the zoning at Higgins Beach has really been out of in out of step with with the lot sizes and the character of Higgins Beach. Um, and in the last 10 or 15 years, we really noticed this as, as changes are taking place uh, at Higgins Beach more than they have in the past. So this slide is a sketch that tries to show three historic cottages and one that isn't. Uh, this is a quiz now, which one doesn't fit in. <laughs> um, and it's showing essentially what the current zoning is producing in terms of uh, building placement, building size, um, its its relationship to the street, etc. So, this is trying to uh, illustrate uh, the needs for updates to the zoning. <coughs> As I mentioned earlier, we spent a lot of time in June um, down at Higgins Beach. We were there um, within the community for for three three days, talking through um, the opinions and views of of residents and property owners and and what they think important about development at Higgins Beach or additions and, and how the zoning should be shaped. We also spent a lot of time walking around, observing older cottages, new, new homes, and everything in between to, to, to better understand how the code should be written. As part of that process, we did a fair amount of surveying, um, and there was a lot of surveys that were, were offered and, and provided in this. And I realize you can't read this from your seats, but there was a lot of 50-50s uh, on views at Higgins Beach, as you would likely expect. Um, you know, some were in favor of allowing two-family buildings, some weren't. Some were comfortable with larger homes being allowed, some weren't. Um, but the one or two primary things there's consensus around is the one that circled, and that question was, do you think the new buildings should reflect the existing character of Higgins Beach? And that was, there was um, a clear support and majority for that. So what does that mean? Um, um, and that's what this code is trying to, to get at is in terms of allowing additions and new construction that is in character with um, Higgins Beach and the existing uh, development down there. So I've touched on this a little bit already, but the current challenges are the building setbacks really don't work for the lot size of the Higgins Beach. The Higgins Beach lots are 50 by 100, by and large. Um, and with a setback of 30 feet to the front, 15 to both sides, that really doesn't produce uh, reasonable additions or allow reasonable, reasonable new construction. The setbacks are also disrupting, disrupting kind of proper building placement so that new construction is in line with the existing cottages or additions are um, sitting properly on lots as compared to um, existing construction down there. It's also producing inconsistent building scale. You know, taller buildings that are tall and narrow that um, 
aren't really fitting in with uh, the historical pattern of Hagen's speech. And there's restrictive um, development coverage. A lot of Hagen's <coughs> speech is also regulated by the shoreland zone. The shoreland zone limits generally development to 20%, um, and that's buildings and parking, et cetera. Um, when the <coughs> development at Higgins Beach is 35% uh, on, on a property. So we looked at how do we adjust that to make it consistent with Higgins Beach to allow development to be horizontal, not just vertical. And the other, probably the biggest challenge at Higgins Beach is the general uncertainty. Uh, the, you have to go to the zoning board to, and get a variance to essentially do do anything down there and there's a lot of uncertainty with that and doesn't give both the zoning board or um, property owners and applicants any clear direction as to what um, what's something that's approvable. So the goals for this zoning repair are to enable additions, to enable renovations and new construction that are in character with Higgins Beach um, and, and that neighborhood to eliminate the, the variance or the zoning board review process for making those types of changes um, and to establish <coughs> a character-based or to allow character-based changes uh, and I'll get into that <coughs> a little bit later through administrative review. So a typical building permit process where we look at the zoning and, and review it and then issue a permit. And the other thing that we felt was pretty important is to try to align or coordinate the environmental regulations that also apply to a lot of Higgins Beach with um, with the local zoning, so that shoreland zoning is um, coordinated and, and consistent with um, the underlying zoning, and also to try to highlight the other jurisdictions that apply. Um, there's there's floodplain ordinance. There's the uh, the flood areas that require certain things. We want that to relate to the zoning, sand dune requirements down there as well as um, the shoreland zone, as I mentioned earlier. So the goal is to create a code that allows new development or additions that are in character and, and similar building placement and um, as the existing development down there. So there's character districts that are proposed. Um, and the predominant character district or zoning district is a coastal residential one district that would apply to the vast majority of Higgins Beach. This aerial view shows uh, the Higgins Beach neighborhood. This zone would apply to essentially all the properties but for the few commercially used properties today at Higgins Beach. And in this district, there is a variety of um, standards. Um, and the standards are focused around actually making the current lots roughly 50 by 100 conforming. Right now that's non-conforming. The lot sizes down there are non-conforming, so we want to make the lots conforming. And also establish setbacks that allow buildings to be placed closer to the street and closer to side property <coughs> lines and leaving a rear yard space um, so that the setbacks are set up to mimic the existing pattern at Higgins Beach versus today's setbacks. There's also some standards around uh, accessory buildings, where accessory buildings would go on a property, towards the rear of the property. The other district that's proposed, and it would only apply to four lots, is a coastal mixed-use district. And this is really intended to make conforming the four commercial or institutional properties that are down at Higgins Beach. Uh, we're trying to make residential properties conforming and also under the code make the existing commercial uses down there conforming so that they have certainty, that they can go to the planning board for site plan review to add on or to make changes, things like that. Um, so those four properties are the Higgins Beach Inn, which you see here, the Higgins Beach Clubhouse, uh, which is also shown here, the Higgins Beach Market out on uh, Spurwink Road and the Breakers Inn down at Higgins Beach. So those would become conforming uh, land uses under, under this proposal. And like the other district, there would be uh, a specific district in terms of building setbacks and, and lot sizes and things of that nature. The third kind of area of the code which applies more to this end of Higgins Beach is 
the coastal overlays, and that would be the shoreland zoning, floodplain, sand dune regulations. We can't change much um, as it relates to floodplain or sand dune. We can't change anything, actually. Um, but we thought it was important to include in this in this code reference to those ordinances so people can look at um, one ordinance and at least understand how the other regulations interact with um, a proposal they might have. The one thing we can change, um, and it's highlighted here, is that we're proposing to increase the development coverage allowed in the shoreland zone to 35% instead of the 20 that I mentioned earlier, uh, which the state will allow us to do if you demonstrate that that's the existing situation, the existing pattern down at Higgins Beach. And so we've had that outreach with them and they're comfortable with that giving, given the, the character of Higgins Beach and that can be helpful for some properties that might be under the percentage that might want to add on to be similar to a neighbor or to use their lot at a greater coverage. It also could be helpful for the few properties that aren't built on yet where they can develop uh, in a similar fashion to the developed lots down there. So another piece of uh, the code is to kind of highlight different building types um, down at Higgins Beach. And the code does this for a couple of different reasons. There's, there's some historical um, kind of indicative building types at Higgins Beach that exist. This is the Coastal Cottage. And there's a, a good number of these that still exist at Higgins Beach. And the code includes kind of standards around those. And that's intended to enable owners, uh, property owners down there, who may want to continue to have a coastal cottage, but they want to expand. They want to add on in a way that would be allowed under the code. So this is included in the code, not because we expect many people would build new coastal cottages, but some owners may be interested in adding more square footage. That's the trend down in Higgins Beach, is that add more living space, make them more four season. So property owners, uh, under this code would have kind of a blueprint as to how do you add on to a coastal cottage and meet the zoning setbacks. So it, this little sketch kind of helps illustrate that. On the right is perhaps an existing cottage that's pretty small in terms of square footage. And this shows how it's pretty easy to add on a rear addition in the code, the middle um, sketch and then shows how you add on a rear addition, uh, maybe some second floor space like gable dormers. Um, and there's a variety of other kind of ways to add on that is indicative of Higgins Beach and that, that kind of fits in with the architecture and that neighbors would expect. Um, so that's the intent behind having this kind of house type in the code. Bungalows also are down in Higgins Beach. Um, they're there's a good number of them. Um, some have already been added onto, others haven't. So again, in the code, there's highlighted here um, pretty clear direction on easy ways to add on to bungalows that kind of keep the character of the bungalow from the street, but add that square footage that many people are desiring um, when they want to expand down at Higgins Beach. More, more than likely, if there's new construction, it's going to be a house, just a and these are some more historical houses, um, but the code has a whole section on, on, the, on the, the, the style of house, the width, the depth, um, I shouldn't say style, the kind of the form of a house, the width, the depth, stories, that kind of thing, that placement on a lot to, um, to give direction as to how to go about new construction at Higgins Beach. The other piece of the code is building components. And, and that essentially means like adding on a porch, adding on a rear addition, adding dormers, things like that. Um, and so the code has a section on how you go about doing that and, and how close to property lines additions and components can be. Again, trying to get at more square footage while out without um, impacting neighbors or, or getting um, so large that it perhaps is out of character with Higgins Beach. And so these, sort of the tricky thing with a code like this is these are trying to show examples as to how you would add on. That doesn't mean the architecture needs to be exactly like in these pictures. Um, so there are standards around kind of dimensions and scale, but 
in terms of style, the code isn't trying to dictate style architecture as much as kind of form and scale and, and size. Another piece that we've included here is different ways to go about elevating buildings for flood proofing. As I mentioned earlier, um, a portion of Higgins Beach is in multiple different flood zones. So in some cases, if new construction occurs or if you invest heavily in an addition, into an addition or renovation, you actually have to elevate your structure above, um, above the base flood elevation. And so that creates some kind of unique challenge of the architecture. So this is um, providing some options as to how you can go about um, doing that elevating of the structure while also kind of fitting in with, with the area. If lastly, parking is a, a big thing down at Higgins Beach, also on private property. Um, and right now, if new construction happens, parking is kind of happening in the front yard because the houses are actually taking up the, the middle or the rear of the properties. That's not common with um, the older style construction at Higgins Beach. So if we're encouraging buildings to come back forward to the street, um, the code provides some guidance on parking on the sides, <coughs> excuse me, and access to the rear so that um, buildings can be close to the street, front porches, things like that, which is the, really the pattern and, and character of Higgins Beach. So in terms of what the code is and isn't, um, it's trying to get at character through kind of building placement, uh, the form of buildings, you know, scale, massing. <coughs> Uh, how close they are to property lines, where they relate to the street. It isn't intended to be about style or mandating repetitive architecture. I mean, if you look at the code, the little houses that are shown in the code are, they all kind of look the same and they <coughs> look a bit repetitive. Um, and that's really just to try to illustrate examples. It's not trying to say each house has to look like this on each particular lot. Um, so, to help understand that a bit further, our consultant worked on, you know, a couple different <coughs> alternatives. One is the one to the, I, guess, see, I know it's hard to see with the monitors, and, um, but the house to the left is kind of what you'd see in the code. You know, it's New England style house. Um, the one to the right is, is very different. It's more, it's certainly a more modern alternative approach. Um, but based on reviewing the code, you know, both could happen at Higgins Beach. So that's trying to illustrate that it's more about scale, form, um, than it is about specific architecture. This is a map of uh, the zoning changes. I mentioned earlier the vast majority of uh, the neighborhood is proposed for the Coastal Residential One District. That's the I guess it's sort of an orange pink up there. Um, and then there's the four properties proposed to be the limited commercial, which are the darker, sort of the orange brown. And then there are a few areas of Higgins Beach that aren't proposed to change uh, under this zoning. There's a few condominium uh, developments on your way in to Higgins Beach. Those are kind of meet the current zoning perfectly well. They were developed probably in the know, 60s or 70s, uh, maybe after, um, under the current zoning. There's Kelly Lane, which is a similar um, residential street that's developed more recently. And then there's Harmons Island, which um, essentially is built out right now, and there's it doesn't really fit the pattern of Higgins Beach. So discussions were had around that, and the feeling was that uh, those areas shouldn't be included into <coughs> this code because we don't want to make them non-conforming like we're trying to reverse um, with this code at Ticket Speech. And as uh, Mr. Mazur introduced, there's actually three different proposed changes. There's the, the zoning ordinance amendments for the character districts. There's the zoning map amendment that I just showed, um, as well as the shoreland zoning amendment regarding 35% development coverage, uh, which is under the shoreland zoning ordinance. So. Thanks for allowing this longer presentation. I'm happy to answer questions as they come up.
Uh, I have two before I open it up for public discussion. One, <coughs> thank you for your presentation, number one, but is all of this in a brochure so that citizens can actually get a hold of this? Uh, is that too premature uh, and actually see the actual wording? We've tried to rely heavily on the town's website to push out information since last spring. Um, so we, it's a longer document, so we haven't printed out a lot of complete codes. People have been reviewing it online. There's a whole site, um, Higgins Beach Zoning Repair kind of site. If people want copies, we can certainly can make them, but right now I don't have ones to hand out. Um, but I think that it going forward in the future, that may be useful to people because sure. it is a little complicated and there are changes taking place if, if these all go through to completion that um, would be of interest, I think, to people who sure. are down there now or want to be down there in the future. So I, I would recommend that. The, the only other question I have is the conflict between local and state. Is that a big issue as far as what we hope to accomplish here in, in, in the town? We're influencing what we can influence right now at the state level. Um, that's the shoreland zoning ordinance. We have some ability to get the state to allow unique standards for Higgins Beach, given the uniqueness of Higgins Beach. So that's the 35 percent. Um, there's also some shoreland zoning changes that we're going to look at in the future for entire Scarborough that's affected by shoreland zoning in, in terms of uh, how much you can add on to an existing structure in the shoreland zone. Um, but there are conflicts with kind of local zoning and local development at Higgins Beach through the sand dune regulations at the state. <coughs> and that's not something we have the ability to change. Um, so those kind of conflicts will remain. Um, but what we tried to do is just highlight the important pieces of those other regulations so that people can be looking at the zoning code and also see that so that they're not designing a house and then being surprised later by DEP or others that they can't do what they thought they could do and kind of vice versa. So there's some kind of, there's some danger in showing in a local code references to other regulations because then people can perceive them as being local regulations. So we've tried to temper that by disclaimering it that, you know, these aren't local regulations, but we're doing it more for kind of reference, um, informational purposes to kind of help them at the end of the day. So. Yeah, th that was where I was going with that, yeah. that somebody comes in and all of a sudden they get broadsided by something after they've started a process. So that's I wanted to highlight that. Yep. Thank you, Dan. Uh, before I turn it over to the board, we will now open this up uh, to public comment, and we'll do this individually uh, since there are three separate proposals. The first is the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive input regarding the proposed amendments to Zoning Ordinance Chapter 405 to add the Higgins Beach character-based code. So if anybody would like to address that issue, please come to the podium, give us your name and address, and please limit your comments to five minutes. I'm Walter Wilson from the design company out of Scarborough, out of Saco, and I want to say I've been working with the uh, all the parties involved in this code in the process of reviewing what they're proposing. And I will say a couple things that have changed over the first initial introduction of what was going to take place. Originally it was, pre it was presented, we all got the impression, uh, local residents and designers like I am, that the only houses you could build under this code were the three that were shown in the booklet. And <clears throat> as you heard from Dan tonight, Two of those are pretty much to give guidance to the houses that already exist, and the new home shows not just a basic style of what you can do, but uh, the 
the character they're looking for can vary from the pictures that are shown in the book. I was very pleased to hear that. Um, as a matter of fact, up until just recently, uh, it was understood by a lot of people that I deal with at Higgins Beach that the only thing you could build was these three buildings that were shown in the book. So I'm very glad to hear that. I have also had a meeting with, <coughs> with Dan last week <coughs> and went over several little things that I pointed out to him. I have not heard back from him yet on those things I plan to in the future. And a lot of the, the things that took place in the initial drafts leading forward to the final draft where I had questions about certain things have been worked out. So I'm glad that the, the planning department has worked with not only questions I had, but from what other people in the town have had also. Um, Dan didn't mention um, the parking thing. As you know, parking at Higgins Beach is the problem. Okay, um, And like Dan has said, a lot of the cars are end up parking in front of the houses. And that was one of the reasons why they wanted to bring it forward a little bit as far as setback goes, so you wouldn't have room to park the car there and you have to park it on the side. I understand that. It makes good sense. Um, if you look at the older cottages that are still out to Higgins Beach, a lot of them are close to the street. And I've been doing this long enough to remember some of the things back many decades ago. Uh, we had discussions about things about an zone because I used to be on a zoning board. Uh, why these houses were close to the street? There was two reasons why they were close to the street. One was to have porches in the front where you can talk to people walking by and say how how you doing and this kind of stuff. The biggest reason was they had horses and buggies and they had to put the horses up in the backyard, not in the front yard. So they pulled the houses to the front. And then when you have lots back to back, all the horses and the animals and the buggies are in the back of the two houses, and the houses are up close to the street so that the daily businesses of the horses wouldn't interfere with the traffic on the road. Uh, that was a major reason why. Um, today, we don't have that situation, but we have automobiles. Um, <clears throat> and the idea of setting the houses closer to the lot line where you have room to set the house on one side of the lot and create a little more room on the other side will open up the aspect of having a place for a driveway to go down the side of the house instead of in the front. I think that's all a good idea too. I don't have any, any problems with that reduction of setbacks, the front yard setbacks at all. I think it's a good idea. My biggest concern has always been the aesthetics of what it's going to look like when it's done. And we have heard from the beginning we want to maintain the character of Hidgings Beach. I've always had a problem with that. Which character were you trying to maintain? The one that existed pre-World War II or the character that has evolved into what it is today, which is a majority of different types of houses down there? And um, uh, we have every, every style of house just about you can think of at Higgins Beach that I deal with. The older homes that are there, the ones who have been maintained and kept up, <coughs> fine. But I've been in some of these cottages where you wouldn't dare to walk across the floor. Um, uninsulated walls, plumbing that, that's non, almost non-existent, electricals, the old, the old wiring which is not allowed anymore, uh, the structure isn't satisfactory, and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of those homes went through the zoning board prior to having the practical difficulty ordinance, which was adopted later, had to go through what was called the yard reduction variance. And at that time, pretty much you had to remodel the house from the inside out because you weren't allowed to take down walls in certain instances, and everything had to be done from the inside out, creating a lot of labor. Then the practical difficulty variance came along. Now, when the practical difficulty variance came along, which in essence, you go to the zoning board, you can get relief on your sideline setbacks, front line setbacks, you can get relief on total lot coverage, you can get relief on just about anything there is, as long as you're not in the shoreland zone. What this did, it made a change in how these cottages were getting remodeled. Because before you had to pretty much keep where they were, with, with, with this you could tear them down. And when you started tearing them down, going to the board, you'd ask for all these different variances. In some places you'd be only three or four feet from the property line on the variance. This started creating 
I think some of the problems that arose with Higgins Beach houses being what some people would say overbuilt. I think this had a lot to do with the practical difficulty variance that the town implemented, which I think was implemented trying to relieve the problem of the uh, <coughs> side yard setback restrictions that were on the ordinance. Now, when this one ordinance comes across, now we have kind of like a compromise between the practical difficulty with almost no setbacks with a 15-foot setback. We're kind of like in the middle of that range with this ordinance. And I think this is more practical to use than the practical difficulty is, which I think started creating some of the problems at Higgins Beach as far as setbacks go in the, in the aspect of building new houses. The, <coughs> the old um, variants of yard setbacks created some of these weird shapes on these houses because on the, other, on the old, which is still in existence, by the way, the side yard setbacks, if your house was six feet from the property line, you could get a variance down to ten feet from the property line. Well, that means if you put a second story on, the second story gets set in from the outside wall of the first floor. And you get some of these places that get towers going up in the middle of the building and offset uh, walls from first floor to second floor. Um, that started creating odd shapes in places at Higgins Beach. Um, this ordinance, I think, will allow people who are going to take and remove an existing house and build a new house, I think we're going to allow them as much um, setback relief as they need to do it for a new house at Higgins Beach. Um, I don't think that the... Um, um, that the total amount of what I call add-ons, or the components that are allowed, uh, are enough to, saddle, uh, are enough to uh, satisfy some of the design requests you might have in an existing house. Uh, and I'm not sure if, like for example, it says you can add a bay window to, to the component. Well, can you add a different type of window, a box-out window, or something like that? It doesn't address those features. I'm hoping that those features that are in the catalog of review are kind of like a suggestion thing, and other different alternatives can be done if you're working with the planning department. I don't know. It doesn't say in the, in the book. Um, little things that I have noticed is you start with a basic house, your rear addition, on the, according to the ordinance, only allows you to go straight back instead of maybe offsetting the rear addition, which I've talked to Dan about. Um, and go, by going straight back, you're going to make the house look longer and longer and longer instead of having an offset from the addition to the rear. Um, I don't know if Dan has got around to looking at that because I only talked to him about it, I think, last Friday. And I'd like to, if it possible, have him maybe address some of those concerns I had with him on Friday. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I let you go longer because you, I was hearing things that were very relevant, so that's why I let you go over the five minutes. Anybody else? Okay, hearing none, I'll close it to the public and open it up to the board. Sue, I'll start with you. You were on the Long Range Planning Committee, and so I think you would be the appropriate individual. <laughs> you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, I have been around since Moses parted the Red Sea, and this is an issue that's been existing in Scarborough forever. Um, I want to give commendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals and how they'd managed to try to hold it all together, but the time had come to try to do something to make it um, really a usable ordinance. And I want to congratulate the, the planning department. The, um, the, the uh, Long Range Planning Committee essentially was a, like a sounding board for what the, um, the planning department and the um, consultant that we worked with came up with and it was really very complicated and at the beginning I sort of took a prove it to me attitude because wow he can speech <laughs> what can you do well I think we can do a lot as a result of what we're looking at here and um, I think it's 
it may end up in in use having a bit of the proof of the pudding kind of thing. There may be some things that have to be looked at again later after we actually use it. But I think it's been an incredible uh, process, and um, I'm excited about it, and I would like to see it passed and have a chance to give it a go. Thank you. Thank you. Roger? <coughs> Thank you. Um, I, too, would <coughs> like to commend all the uh, parties that were involved in this, uh, um, especially the, um, the residents of Higgins Beach that turned out during the summer and uh, attended the uh, meetings and gave their input. Um, I think it's a, a good move. Um, it seems like it's going to make the whole process much easier. Um, so um, I, I'm in favor of this as well. So, thank you, Nick. Yeah, uh, there's an incredible amount of work that's obviously gone into this for a long amount of time, and uh, I have to appreciate everyone's efforts on it. I think this is a good step. Uh, as Susan illustrated, though. Sometimes when you put things into practice, uh, you'll find that you'll need to revisit it and kind of fine tune it. And I hope that this town and the residents are going to be patient through that type of process. Um, and we'll get it eventually. And, and this is a, a fantastic first step. So, the lights. You're by yourself down there, Mike. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's an awful lot. And uh, hat off to everybody who uh, <clears throat> participated in it. I have a couple just quick questions. Dan, I um, thought I heard you say that 50 by 100 lots, w was that representative of most of the lots down there or not representative? It is. The, yes. the vast majority are 50 by 100 lots. There are some that have been combined over the years, so there's some 100 by 100 lots and then there's some anomalies. But uh, when Higgins Beach was laid out originally back early 1900s, they were essentially all 50 by 100 Plus or minus, there's some right. that aren't exactly rectangular. But now, when you, when you look at this document, if it's if this document is adopted as as, as it's drafted before us here, uh, could you take a guess as to over the last 10 years or 20 years or 15 years of all the uh, <clears throat> renovations and rebuilding that's going on down there? Would it have would have it often have would it have fit inside this model much better than than what we actually experience. In other words, we, the idea here is that you're not going to see so many folks needing to go to the ZBA right. to do what they need to do. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. And I, I think that um, there would have been a lot of different architecture that has happened over the last 15 years. I think that, and Walt you know, knows better than I, but uh, the process that people would go through is they'd have an existing cottage and they'd sort of be tearing it down and saying, I have this existing footprint and I'm trying to build a house that's not entirely conforming, but more conforming to the, z to the R4 zoning, mm -hmm. which is less conforming to the character of Higgins Beach in terms of where the house sits and how close it gets to property lines and, and maybe what it looks like, given that they're probably more <coughs> tall and narrow and centered on a lot. So... Um, I think the general desire at Higgins Beach is to modernize cottages so that they can accommodate more family members or they can become four season properties. And um, I think we would have seen a lot of different construction down there, probably more horizontal construction because uh, lot coverage is a big constraint right now and probably construction that's more consistent to the house placement that exists at Higgins Beach versus what we got. We got something in between the current zoning and and the old character, and I think we'd head back towards the old character. Now, on the uh, residential piece, I think I saw that uh, a minimum setback could be reduced to eight feet. Yeah, you're allowed to put... Um, a side yard I'm talking about in particular. Yeah, you're allowed to... Um, go to you know, five feet on side property lines. Yeah. Five feet. Five feet. To a front property line, you're allowed to add a single-story addition as close as eight feet to the front property line. I'm more curious about the, the side, side yard setback. Yeah. Um, how much of a reduction is this proposing over what we have today or what you might envision is possible through a, um, a, a, an appeals process? 
Currently, the requirement is 15 feet on both sides. Is there any and was there any discussion about the potential for fire hazards or? One of the requirements in the code is if you're less than 15 feet, you need to fire rate that side of the structure, which is you need to use additional sheathing, you know, different additional protection because it could be closer to a neighbor. Um, the fire department's reviewed that. And, and that's actually what we require in some existing subdivisions like Eastern Village, Dunstan Crossing. Or if you drive through those neighborhoods, they're, maybe the architecture is a little different, but the same kind of character <laughs> uh, building placement. And mm -hmm. that's been uh, an expectation in those neighborhoods for the last you know, eight or 10 years. So. Um, and it, from my experience, it's a little unusual to see a <coughs> We're calling this a code, but it's really a new district, is it not? It is, yeah. It's a new zoning district. And, yeah. and it, it's a little unusual to see, like, for example, the, the commercial, the, what do you call it, CDL or CML? or The mixed-use zone, I mean, zone, yeah. there's four distinct properties located, which, of course, speak to the four commercial properties in this area. Yeah. Do you inv uh, is there a process where, you know, that can be expanded or... I mean, oftentimes we see folks that want to change their right. zone from one thing to another. Yeah, there was actually, there's a lot of discussion in the neighborhood about the mixed-use zone and the limits of it. Mm -hmm. um, there was, for a while, consideration um, for that mixed-use zone to extend along um, ocean, along the entrance into Higgins Beach, you know, in the vicinity of the parking lot. Um, and I think some folks thought that was reasonable, others were concerned about that, so we kind of took that off the table for now and we can come back to it. Um, we didn't want that to become the discussion around this. Right. The, this was focused on residential properties primarily, so, so yeah, I think there's opportunities to come back to that if there's interest in coming back to that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks yeah, that, that thought your last point was well taken. Uh, before I move on, in case anybody is wondering who the woman is and the far left over there, for those of you who are not familiar with her, that is Angela Blanchett, our new town engineer. And uh, she's trying to absorb all of this in a short period of time, uh, being newly hired by, by the town. Uh, Angela, do you have any comments on any of this? I didn't want you to think I was ignoring her or anything. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I've, I've already asked my questions, and I think some of my board members have certainly addressed some other issues. Um, I guess looking around, the consensus. Go ahead, go ahead. Just, just one question, Dan. Um, what's been the response generally from the Higgins Beach oh. neighborhood? I mean, is it basically pretty positive about this, or? That's my perception, but I yeah, don't want you. I don't want to speak for the Higgins Beach neighborhood. <laughs> so. I mean, have you had a lot of have you had a lot of people complain about this? Or we've had a lot of per participation, certainly, yeah. um, and I think um, most of all, I think the neighborhood is appreciative of the amount of time spent and sort of the pr the process we've conducted. Um, we've tried to be very inclusive and went to Higgins Beach for three days to really kind of learn a lot about Higgins Beach and about what people, how they view Higgins Beach. So I can say that. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think there's people that are excited about, people that are reluctant, you know, are optimistic but skeptical. You know, I don't, I don't know all the different views, but um, I think the process to date has been positive from my vantage point. But okay. I, if I don't, if you don't mind me just following up on one item, Walt asked about additional kind of updates. Um, and I have appreciated kind of Walt's review, and I think he brings a lot of history and kind of practicality to the review of the code because he's designed a lot of houses down there. So I am going to work further on, you know, adjustments as we go. Um, you know, we talked through a good number of kind of detailed adjustments that that I think we can likely make that don't, you know, dramatically change the proposal but could avoid some problems. So.
So I am going to be working on those before second reading by the council. It won't be done before tomorrow, uh, Wednesday night's public hearing. But um, and I think board members were right on in terms of the need to revisit this after six months, 12 months, 18 months, because I know this is vastly better than the current zoning, but I, I also i am sure it's not perfect. So we're trying to take steps towards improving the current situation, which pushes everything to the zoning board. And I think this is pretty good, but I'm sure there are things we're going to learn along the way that um, we're going to need to adjust. And so we'll kind of keep track of those things. Yeah, before I close this off, I, I would also like to say that I, during my tenure here on the board, heard uh, comments from people who are residents down there and also members of the ZBA and their frustration of how to deal with a lot of these uh, facets of this recommendation. And I think it sort of just puts it all together. And uh, But if I'm hearing no other comment, I think I can speak for the board in saying that we will pass on a favorable recommendation to the council. <coughs> the next of the three. The planning board will conduct a public hearing on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to delineate the Higgins Beach character districts. I will open it up to the public. Is there anybody who would like to talk to this aspect of the proposals? Mr. Wilson, keep your comments down to five minutes this time, sure. please. Walter Wilson again. I have a little bit of a problem with this in that we have those existing commercial things as they exist. Okay, I'm worried about any one of these locations being able to change what they what their operation is into something else versus what's there now, whether it be a retail store or something like this, which doesn't fit into the existing character of Higgins Beach. So my concern in those districts is how much control is there, if any, on the character of these things changing by changing the use that's put into these buildings, where and right now it, it's not at Higgins Beach, and and if it is changed to something else, what are the ramifications, say, such as for parking and um, access to this uh, new, new type of use that may be within either one of these buildings, either one of these locations? And the primary one I'm really concerned is the breakers, because that's kind of isolated by itself down by the beach. And you get a lot of pedestrians walking by there. And I don't know if a store might go in or what kind of shop might go in. Uh, which in itself might change the character of the area. So that's it. Thank you. Dan, if any of these four facilities wanted to do changes, they'd have to come to the board, wouldn't they? Under the proposal, or am I incorrect? <laughs> if a commercial use adds on, changes parking, changes driveways, changes their site plan, they come to the planning board. But what so if, as Mr. Wilson said, they want to change from being what they are now to a retail store or so something other than they currently are? So if, they aren't, if they're not changing their <coughs> building size, they're not changing their parking layout, um, you know, if they're not changing anything on the site, they wouldn't trigger site plan review under the current site plan ordinance. Okay, thank now you. that's typical whether it's Higgins Beach or Dunstan or Route 1. So that's okay. Again, before I open it up to the board, is there anybody else who would like to speak to this proposal? Uh, my name is uh, Roger Shabbat. I live at 12 Houghton Street at Higgins, and I'm president of the uh, Higgins Beach Association. And the reason I'm here today is to thank you folks for letting this thing happen at uh, Higgins. It started in June. We worked closely with Dan. And uh, at the end of that first three-day meeting, we set up a uh, um, whatever Dan was putting on his website 
we would also put it on our website. Any type of communications, whether it be by mail or email, we would personally send it to uh, everybody <coughs> that was on our website. So the majority of the people at Higgins were well informed of the process that was going on. And at the uh, last meeting that we had at the clubhouse, we must have had at least 100 people there listening to what the consultants were uh, presenting. So uh, I believe that with the help of Dan and the town, it was a uh, very well, well worth effort to change the zoning that uh, has been presented tonight. And uh, I'm not talking, of, uh, talking with the people, but uh, I'm certainly uh, approval of what has been happening. And I believe uh, a good majority of our people have too. So again, I thank you and the town and Dan for <coughs> all the efforts that were put in. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Rodney Lawton, and I'm the owner of property at Two Bayview Avenue, the Breakers Inn. So I've acquainted myself with what the committee's put together for recommendations for Higgins Beach, and I would hope the board would you know, go along with these recommendations. As I understand it, there are some limitations on what could go in at Two Bayview Avenue. Um, so I, as I said, I, I, I hope that the, the plan will go through as presented, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Anybody else? I will say that it is impressive. I'm, unfortunately, I was away when all of that took place. Uh, to have the amount of people who did attend, that's unusual, uh, but certainly very favorable, in my opinion, that that many people participated uh, in, in the process, uh, whether they are for or against. All right, open it up to the board. Let's start with you this time. Okay. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure this is specific to just the map. I don't really have anything positive or negative to say about the map, but in speaking of what is permitted, it, this document does, it appears to be more, much more vague than, than what I'm used to seeing as to what's permitted in one district over another. Why, dinosaurs amongst us. <laughs> um, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that's bad or good, but like in, th in this, in this uh, district here, the Higgins Beach district that allows commercial use, it just speaks about um, in-building, shop house, neighborhood store. The building, the building types. The building yeah. type. Yeah. So is there an area here that actually speaks to what that building type may be as, uh, as it relates to a use? Yeah, they're the last page, so you probably didn't make it that far. I okay. wouldn't blame you if you didn't. No. Um, <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> the last page probably looks more familiar yes, to that's you, Mr. Wood, in that okay. we did include the more typical permitted use language that we have in other zones. So. So to, to I, I think to answer Mr. Wilson's question, he, you probably saw this too, because I would imagine that this has been vetted out to the point where folks believe that this is in keeping, any of these uses is in keeping with the character that one desires to see at Higgins Beach, because it does mention automobile repair, right? Or excludes, it excludes that. Yeah, no automobile repair. There, there's the only uses allowed in the, the mixed commercial um, are ones that currently exist at Higgins Beach. So it recognizes Higgins Beach Market, it's retail, recognizes bed and breakfast slash hotel, which is um, the Breakers or Higgins Beach Inn. Um, so retail sales and service excluding. There's a restaurant within okay. the Higgins Beach Inn. So it's, it's trying to be fairly constrained and limi limiting, um, but still allowing kind of those essential activities that exist at Higgins Beach right now. Okay, and then the special exceptions. Yeah, there are a few home occupations that exist now. There's a art studio uh, home occupation, and then so okay. it's, it's 
the mixed use zone is limited kind of as it's titled all right so I mean that that that's fine with me now that thanks for directing me to the last page I didn't I didn't get that far. <laughs> so I apologize uh, but I, I don't have anything much more to say about the map okay so I'm glad you cleared that up too <laughs> yeah. I'm all set right now but I'm all set so not set too. So my, that was the only issue that I had in my own mind. So again, uh, hearing from the board, we will give a favorable recommendation to the council as far as the uh, uh, zoning map is concerned. The last issue, uh, proposal, excuse me, uh, dealing with this particular project is the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405C, the Town of Scarborough Shoreline Zoning Ordinance to address the development coverage allowance in the Higgins Beach area. Any public comment on this? Yeah, Walter Wilson again. Um, as I understand it in the ordinance, outside of the overlay districts and the zoning district, uh, the Sherland zoning district, the allowable percentage development area on the lot has been er erased. There is no percentage of lot coverage. What you have is a parameter within which you can build a building based on the setbacks from the side and the front and the building type that you choose to use. Uh, so the change that was made in the setbacks on the sides and the front reduced what the setback is. The setback in the rear was increased from 15 to 30 feet. So the backyard setbacks have been increased. Now, within those areas and the building types you choose, which give the size and shape of the parameter of the building you can put in, the development coverage has been done away with as far as lot coverage goes of a building. Um, some of the people that talked to me about this didn't understand that. They thought that the percentage of developable area was going to stay the same. Some thought it was going to increase, but basically it's been done away with and no longer exists under this code. And the building size is based on the dimensional maximums that's allowed for the type of building you choose to build that's spelled out in the ordinance under those building characteristics. Um, I had mentioned before to Dan at one of the meetings by changing the rear setback from 15 to 30, a lot of the houses at Higgins Beach right now are built within that space and they'll all automatically become non-conforming, whereas right now they may be conforming. Uh, that may, in the future, if they want to do something, have an effect on what they can do and how the process is going to be handled. Also, in the fact that the vast majority of the houses at Higgins Beach are built with up to that 15-foot rear setback, if not even closer. And the idea that Dan was talking about was about opening up the backyards. Well, you aren't going to open up the backyards of the houses that are already there. You're basically talking about opening up backyards on houses that may be built, which means tearing down ones that are already there to build a new house. So the net effect of opening up the back setback to 30 feet may be very minimal as far as opening space up, but may be a lot more restricted to the houses that are already there because they will now become non-conforming in the backyards. And that's my big concern about the development coverage, to explain it, that there is no percentage of lot coverage, and it's all based on building type that you go to put up that makes you setback. And my worry is the 30-foot setback at the rear yard. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Dan, you want to address that before I go on? Yeah, and this is, um, I think those are, those are good points and comments. They don't relate to the shoreland zoning change so this is more kind of comments back to the first item but in terms of the rear yard setback that's intentional in that if you're not going to have a development coverage 
if you don't limit the amount of development in the rear yard and you also don't have much of a setback in the front yard, then you're going to see a house that takes up essentially the, the entire lot. So that's part of the goal here is to have new construction or in the case of existing houses, new additions to happen towards the front, which is typical of Hagen Speech. So say there is a house that happens to be back not that they can't change the house, they just probably are maybe adding on towards the front versus the back. Um, but um, there isn't in the code proposed to be a, a building coverage or lot coverage we, because as Walt indicated, we think that the overall requirements in terms of dimensions of houses and additions will kind of serve that function. Um, houses can only be a certain maximum size. Um, and except for in the shoreland zone where the state expects you to have a development coverage, and that's where we're changing it from 20% to 35%. So that's, that's what's proposed under this aspect of the shoreland zoning. Thank you. Anybody else? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing and open it up to the board. Um, any comments from anybody on this? My only comment is the eight, the eight foot side yard setback. I, I just, you're saying there's going to be fire retardant type materials used where they might not be at 15 feet? If you're less than 15, you have to change have to materials used? <coughs> yes. You have to take additional steps in terms of fire protection, fire rating, which isn't actually unique to Higgins Beach. It's being done in other areas of town where we see that type of separation. Okay. Yeah. There was no discussion about uh, having to um, sprinkler or anything like that? That's actually in the kind of bucket of options. So it's not limited to, say, additional sheathing or whatever the wall structure is. I think you're also um, Residential sprinklers, actually our fire department is, is increasingly open to residential sprinklers in a variety of um, settings, not just beach communities or you know tightly knit areas, but also more rural areas where fire response is harder. So I think that is a potential option. Okay. Thank you. Dan, the only qu question I have is what, Mr. Wilson, what happens to people who are in conformance now who then in the future may be out of conformance and then they want to do something. How, how does that play out? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Do like you, they you, become non-conforming based yeah, on this? Yeah, they're conforming now and then become non-conforming and then they wish to do something. Well, they if they wish to do something in the part of the building that is non-conforming, then they're probably talking to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yeah. Um, but just because a part of your house is non-conforming doesn't mean you can't do things to in conforming locations on a house. Rarely is a house fully non-conforming. So if you're kind of half in and half out of a setback, then you can expand or add on or do some things if it meets the code on the conforming side without having to do anything more than a building permit process that's outlined here. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, we will, hearing from the board, pass a favorable opinion on to the council. And before I go on to the next agenda item, I want to thank everybody who attended tonight uh, who was interested in, in, in these proposals. Um, they're complicated. I'm not going to sit here and say they aren't. But I hope there's learned something from the process, and if you are interested, I guess the council will have their first reading Wednesday and uh, would continue to listen and learn and give you opinions uh, as you may desire. But again, thank you for all of those of you who attended. Okay, moving on. Agenda number seven, Star Homes, Inc. Request subdivision amendment for sawgrass subdivision assessors MAC R fifty nine lot number two. Okay, you want to introduce this please? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, this is a good follow-up to what we were just talking about in terms of uh, side yard setbacks. Um, <laughs> as board members will recall, this is a subdivision that was approved probably about a year ago at this point for roughly 24 house lots off of um, uh, Sawyer Road. Um, and essentially, uh, let's see, so this subdivision is in the VR4 district which has one of our variable setbacks um, that was just previously referred to where the standard setback is 15 feet, but as part of the uh, review process, or as part of the, the zoning district, frankly, um, the side yard setback could be reduced down to five feet provided that anything less than the 15 feet meets certain fire rating standards that were sort of just talked about. Um, in discussions and, it, there was a bit of miscommunication or uh, misunderstanding about the, uh, the, the variable setback component. Um, and and in, development, in developing this subdivision, there were two lots, I believe, uh, two buildings that were built within the 15-foot setback, um, three buildings, I'm being told, um, that were built within the 15-foot setback, two of which are re going to require a lot line adjustment to make the houses conforming because they were just slightly outside of that 15-foot parameter. Again, this subdivision, if anyone's been through it, much of the infrastructure is in, but the house lots are just getting underway, so making minor lot line adjustments are relatively easy since uh, I believe the properties are still largely under the ownership of the original developer. So um, with that, I'll have the applicant's engineer sort of walk you through what the exact lot line adjustments are, but um, this is a relatively minor adjustment really um, in, in staff's estimation doesn't change any of the review parameters for the board and uh, we have prepared a motion for the board if you're uh, so inclined this evening. With Thank that. you Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Bill Thompson, BH Twin Engineers, the project manager for Star Homes and Joe Fristacci is here tonight. Uh, Jay gave a, a great uh, reference and outline of what uh, we've been faced with here. Um, I submitted a letter November 3rd uh, to the board and basically outlines um, the dilemma we had. Um, we need to amend the plan and we're requesting a, an approval of that tonight. For the side lot lines uh, of lot three and lot six, uh, we were of the understanding when we got approval that the 15 foot side and rear setback, there was a provision or there is a provision to reduce that uh, down to five feet and our understanding was that until you got to the five feet, you did not need to meet the fire rating construction. Hmm. Uh, our approved plan showed 10-foot setbacks on the side, again, thinking we still had the latitude to reduce it, and which is what Joe's uh, preference was with his house style, was to go no closer than 10 feet and still you know, meet all the uh, zoning regulations. Uh, two of the lots um, that are built on that uh, ready for closing uh, the mortgage loan inspection that comes in, the survey comes in to determine if the uh, house meets zoning regulations for setback. And we found that lot three uh, was just a little bit over a foot into the 15-foot setback, which Joe thought he was okay because we were, we were shooting for no closer than 10. And then lot six uh, was about a foot and a half into the 15-foot setback. Uh, so lot two and lot seven, which are the lots on each side of those two, have not been built on. Uh, we've proposed moving the lot line of lot six by two feet to make us, give us two more feet of frontage, which uh, picks up that, that uh, error of a foot and a half. And then lot three, uh, I'm moving the lot line a foot and a half toward lot two. Uh, again, there's no home built on lot two. Joe still owns that lot. Um, still keeps the lots in conformance of the VR4 zone and what we require or allowed to do. Um, so there's really, uh, you know, it's, it's the easiest, I guess, solution. And unfortunately, uh, when we got approval, uh, we were led to believe uh, differently than what's, what's come about with, uh, with the, the ruling after the um, mortgage loan inspection was, was triggered as not um, correct. So we, Joe and I, we've met with uh, the staff and Jim Butler and Code, and I think everyone now uh, better understands uh, as we move forward, uh, so we don't have to come back here again, we'll know the 
uh, the, the setbacks, and if you en encroach upon the 15-foot setback, uh, what you're, you're going to be faced with, which Joe fully understands and uh, <coughs> is accepting that. Uh, in the course of this amendment, uh, we modified lot, excuse me, note number 10 uh, a little bit just to make it uh, a little clearer, if you will, and we added note 10A, and it, and it plugs the uh, fire department into it uh, for the permits, uh, which is important to see if we do need to uh, make any provisions for, for construction. So they're going to play, in my opinion, they're going to play a bigger role in each of the building permits. So when Joe comes in to, to get a building permit, uh, everyone understands what the limits are and who needs to weigh in on the on the permitting. So, with that, um, if you have any questions, but again, we're uh, submitted a uh, a mylar. If the board, uh, um, hopefully, the board is is a, in a, an agreement to uh, approve this tonight, and one of Joe's customers uh, won't be homeless anymore if we can uh, <laughs> move move this along and and uh, record it and then be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as this is an amendment, uh, there is opportunity for public opinion. So if anybody wishes to speak to this amendment, please enter the podium, give us uh, your name and address, and please keep, keep your remarks down to five minutes. Seeing none, close the public. And I'm just going to ask if there is any questions on the part of the board I, I just wanted to uh, can you can you speak to is there anything in the language of the uh, ordinance that can be or should be improved so that that misunderstanding would be yeah. um, avoided by the next yeah, um, you know people read things and, and come out of it with a different interpretation I guess and when I read the uh, BR4 zoning requirements um, it does have the 15-foot setback with a footnote one. And footnote one, I think, was misleading, perhaps just to me, but it says, may be reduced to five feet for single-family dwellings, same residential development, and the abutting dwelling meet the fire rating requirements. So I read that when you get to five feet, that triggers the fire rated construction. So that was my, my interpretation of it. And I could see how it could be. Maybe we could just, through the chair, if I could just suggest, just take a look at the language, make sure. In this case, it seems like it's a pretty easy fix, mm -hmm. but it could potentially not be so easy. So okay. I agree with you, by the way. All right. Uh, hearing no other comments, I move to approve the application of Star Homes, Inc. for the plan titled Amended Final Plan Sawgrass Prepared by BH2M, Inc. Second. I have a second. Any comments? All in favor? Say Thank you. We'll sign the plan after the meeting, and you can pick it up tomorrow morning, or if you want to hang around till the end of the meeting. I suppose you could do that as well. It's <laughs> your choice. <laughs> oh, but don't, don't go there. Don't go there. The next agenda item, Cornerstone Baptist Church requests a site plan amendment review for 415 U.S. Route 1, Assessors Map U38, Lot 5 and 6. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you just know, this is a site plan amendment for the Cornerstone Baptist Church, which is in the B3 zone. Um, by way of background for the board, this site in 2010, I'm sorry, I received a site plan amend, uh, site plan approval for a uh, significant addition to the site and a lot of uh, site improvements including parking lot layout, storm water, um, lighting, landscaping, and, and the, the typical host of items that we go through with a site plan review. Um, since that time, the applicant or the, the property has gone through a lot of those site changes, um, but none of the actual changes to the building had occurred. Um, so at this time, the uh, applicant is before you with a uh, much more modest uh, addition to the building. Um, and in staff's review of this, as, as I noted, a lot of the site improvements have already been accomplished. So really our comments were fairly limited in terms of 
uh, ensuring, ensuring adequate and compliant lighting if there's any egress doors or uh, lighting proposed on the exterior of the building. Uh, pedestrian access paths that the fire department requires to be paved um, and connected from any egress doors. Um, and we did just seek a bit of plan clarity. Um, staff would, took a little bit of time and some conversations to understand exactly what's being sought. Um, so um, I, th I think we've worked through that. And then I really think the final thing for the board to weigh in on this item is ensuring that you're comfortable with the architectural designs, um, that they're compliant with our standards given the sort of scale of the uh, and location of the approval. Are there any issues that the board would like to address? Certainly those um, would be the, the probably the main elements for discussion. Um, with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to the applicant. Uh, good evening. Mike Richmond, Custom Concepts Architecture, and I'm here with David Morse from the Cornerstone Baptist Church. Uh, Jay, you basically went through my entire list of items. I was going to list off to introduce the project. Um, it's a very modest project and one that is uh, not at all visible from Route 1, as Jay and I can attest to when we walked the site the other day. Um, essentially, the, the large addition that was approved back then, um, you know, as we acknowledge that it has expired, it's still the main aspiration of the church. They've done everything externally and now someday want to build this. So what we've done is come up with a way to say, well, here's a chunk to take care of your real immediate internal needs for in, inside stuff associated with the church and, and the associated school with the church. Um, no lawnmowers and snowblowers and those sorts of things. So it's purely internal. Um, it, to be honest, it's, it's sort of a nuts and bolts type of project. We didn't put windows on it because, again, it's somewhat temporary. We haven't put a lot of fluff on it because, uh, you know, the funds are an issue um, and it's temporary and it's not at all visible from any public way. Um, the church has an excellent reputation of gorgeous landscaping, so I'm sure that we could get into more detail of that, but I know that once they build this, they will landscape it properly in keeping with the rest of the area, which is beautiful. Um, like Jay said, there's a few outstanding items, full cutoff light, working with Jim Butler on you know, fire lane access and whatnot, um, but otherwise that's it. I apologize if I confused anybody with the uh, renderings. I hope this clarifies basically the, the blue is the existing building in footprint and the red is what we're proposing off the rear of the building. This here is my depiction of the approved addition from 2007. So from the, um, from the back of the building, that's basically right there. Very simple gable structure. Again, no windows, very clear. It comes off. Someday, the future addition will extend off to the side. If you're looking at it from, uh, from the northeast, which would be the Irving gas station, this is the side that you can see towards the gas station. This would be the addition. A couple double doors. Again, it's so far it's back in the middle of the building, it's really not visible unless you're on the property. And same from the from the southeast. If you drive into their driveway and then past the building, as soon as you get past the building, of course you can see it. This would be up here. Future addition and this little addition <coughs> Available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Um Roger, let's start with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um so, so the future addition is going to go, <coughs> it's going to run, maybe I misunderstand this, but they're going to run to the left of where the temporary addition, or is it going to go out from the, um, yeah, you're calling it like temporary, right? Well, forgive me. It's very much a permanent structure. It's going to be a yeah. slab on grade, yeah. permanent yeah. walls, permanent roof. Um, I mean temporary in the sense of sure, yeah. something yeah. that's yeah. encapsulated in the bigger addition. Correct. Route one is down at the bottom of the right. page. Yeah. So someday, yes, this will be there. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Um, I don't, I don't really have any further questions. I mean, I understand 
you know, what you're trying to do, you're trying to save some money and, and meet some needs, and I don't have a big problem with what, you, what this is. Sue? Sue? I agree. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the long-term um, addition absorbs this, but I think in theory it works. It's part of what you've already been given permission to do, so I have no, I have no problems. Thank you. Nick? I don't have anything to add. No, no problem whatsoever. Um, I imagine that you have no problem with the um, conditions as far as uh, pedestrian access, lighting? No, all, all very simple. Okay, great. And what about the architecture? I'm going to follow up with Mike. Is it, It's going to be similar to, I know, you may have mentioned it, but I, it went by me. In terms of the architecture itself? Yeah. Uh, very simply, uh, Matching roof pitches, matching eave trim, corner boards, uh, basically blending more of the same. Okay, and and again, what's the use going to be for this addition? Basically, interior storage. And just okay, and then you did say no 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 snow blowers, uh, lawn so forth, and so forth. And no windows and no door going out that back either, or is there going to be a... We would have one set of double doors here, mm -hmm. which is, serves two purposes, of course, to get in and out of the position, uh, but also that's one of the egress paths. Uh, and, and to follow up with Mike, the, the, it conforms with people going in and out and... and okay. Uh, I think I don't have any other questions. Anything else from the board? Okay. Hearing none. I move to approve the application of Cornerstone Baptist Church, represented by Custom Concepts, Inc., for a revision to the site plan for the addition of a 28-foot by 33-foot 33 approximate addition with condition that the site plan sheet be modified to address issues related to lighting, pedestrian access, and plan clarity as described in planning staff's memo. The site plan is to be reviewed and approved by the planning department prior to the issuance of a building permit. Second. Comments? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. All right, next agenda item, agenda item number nine. 78 Mitchell Hill Road, LLC, requests a sketch plan discussion for adjustments to the five-lot residential subdivision at 78 Mitchell Hill Road, which has been before the board as part of the preliminary subdivision plan review. Assessors map R10, lot number nine. Jay, you want to sort of... Lead us into this one? Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, this is an item the board has been reviewing um, throughout the summer and fall months. <clears throat> this is for a residential subdivision in the RF district. The property is also encumbered by the shoreland overlay in Stream Protection 2 district, which are associated with the Nunsuch River. As board members will note, uh, the principal issue uh, that the board has been and applicant have been working through is access to the site. Um, principally the access off Mitchell Hill Road, given um, some of the concerns that have been expressed. Uh, the applicant um, has, uh, has heard the board's and staff's prior comments and is taking a, another approach to their access. And so, as noted, um, this, this application is taking a, a different step in the process than we might normally see. This is sort of a a sketch plan in the middle of a formal <laughs> proceeding, um, but it seemed to be uh, like the appropriate step where the applicant, again, had sort of heard, heard board and staff's concerns with the prior access, and they, I think they were, are looking for guidance in terms of um, the, the new um, location. Um, to that end, um, we've, staff's provided comments, we've had discussion, 
with uh, other departments, fire, public works, police, who, um, you know, again, recognizing that this is a conceptual plan, um, you know, still need to see additional details, but at least conceptually understand that this proposal is now on a portion of Mitchell Hill Road that is not quite as steep in slope, and so there seems to be um, some uh, viability to it. However, as noted, there haven't been a great deal of details provided to date, but um, some other issues that staff flagged. Um, with the new location, one of the principal issues now has to do with uh, proximity to the Nonsuch River, and, and particularly the road location uh, was we've identified in our staff comments, as well as the viability of a couple of the proposed lots. Um, let's see, um, other issues that we address, um, again, principally uh, want to be sure that one of the one of the issues that the, the board needs to work through and, de and the details need to be um, more fully vetted or understood is the exact location of the Nonsuch River because as noted this is in the uh, shoreland zone overlay and one of the requirements is that no roads can be, uh, roads aren't to be any closer than 75 feet of, the, of a river unless the board finds otherwise and that in terms of that the board can then reduce the setback to 50 feet. Um, it's not clear if the actual location and edge of the stream or the river, I should say, has been surveyed and detailed on the plans we're reviewing because right now it's, there seems to be a bit of a pitch, pinch point for the road to meet that 50-foot setback that needs to be um, fully understood. Uh, I think with that, Mr. Chair, I'd turn it back to you. And Thank you. And I'll turn it questions as we go. I'll turn it over to the applicant. Great, thank you, uh, members of the board, Mr. Chair. Uh, Lee Allen with Northeast Civil Solutions. Um, here tonight to talk about uh, the 78 Mitchell Hill Road subdivision that was previously before you with a another engineer who has since moved on, taken on the job. He and the applicant came to us and said, hey, would you mind taking this over? What are your thoughts? And we said, listen, we'll, we'll definitely start with a sketch plan and get some feedback. Um, but we thought there was ways to improve the proposal and, and make it more constructible and, and safer from the previous um, proposal. What you see up here on the board is the previous proposal. Uh, coming off of the steeper section, it's approximately somewhere in between 12 and 14 percent. We can tell grade on Mitchell Hill Road where the road is coming off with four interior lots. Um, Our proposal was to move that road down the hill and have an entrance filter here. We understand it's in the shoreline zone, but it's a close to a 6% grade out on Mitchell Hill Road, which uh, we believe makes, makes it safer here. Also, slightly better sight distance looking back up the hill. You're, you're right on the outside of the curve looking back up the hill towards Forum. Um, as Jay alluded to, there, the information on this plan is taken from GIS and aerial. It would need to be surveyed to make sure that we can really do what we think we can do. Um, at this point, we don't know for sure exactly where the location of the river is. We think this is close. Um, but looking at the town's GIS, there's obviously some things going on where that shows the river way up in this area. So I think this plan is correct, but we don't know for sure until we can help them do some survey. Um, we also understand there'd be some environmental permitting that needs to be done to, to get this supply. Um, what we're showing here is the shoreline zone is in this area. We know we need to get the road through the shoreline zone. We, need, we know that it has some obstacles to overcome with uh, town regulation, and that's something we need to work on. But we're really seeking, you know, feedback from you folks on whether this is even a viable option. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to the board. If you have to answer any questions. Okay. Before I turn it over to the board, this is a another proposal in which the public has an opportunity to uh, speak. So if there's anybody from the public who would like to speak, please give again your name, address, and keep your comments down to five minutes. Uh, my name is Herb Prey, and I'm at 80 Mitchell Hill Road. Um, Before you go on, uh, uh, just for the record, we do have a letter from 
to you, okay. and I think all of the board members have received that. So I yes. just want that for that the, was for the one, Okay. Yes, we have. So I won't go through the letter. No, we've read it. I know I read okay. it very carefully. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I know these are um, just preliminary sketches, and, and nothing is, is uh, defined, um, but I know it's, it is off. Uh, when when we, um, uh, Karina and I, my, my wife and I, went through and um, through some of the the information that Jay had sent us, um, you know, we figured, well, let's just go out there and look at it. And uh, you know, th th we had a few questions trying to make sense of the drawing and uh, as it relates to the high water line. Uh, it seems like a lot of the ordinances are uh, based off from. Uh, setbacks and distances uh, as it relates to the high water line. And we really haven't had enough time in doing the research and what exactly is the high water line. Is it 30 feet? Is it 40 feet? According to some of these drawings, you know, we're trying to do the scaling. Obviously, it's a little off, but I'm um, trying to figure out where that setback is. So we were really curious about the setback. Um, and uh, the, another thing that we were kind of wondering is the, the, the setback uh, of the road as it rela relates to our property line. You know, can you put the, the road right next to our property line, or is there a, a minimum distance that, that you have to that you have to set it back? And as it, as we kind of mentioned in the letter, <coughs> um, the. Uh, <coughs> A good portion, you know, like 200 feet of this this road, is still within that what I call the floodplain. Um, and like we mentioned in the in the letter, hmm. the uh, <coughs> it's not uncommon to see that that bridge go underwater. And you know, I know that when they put this road in, they're going to have to build it up. And then, as we kind of went through the the last issue. If you go up, you also have to go out, and I'm just wondering where that's going to end up. Are you going to end up having to move the river? Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know how that's going to happen. Um, so that was that was another question. The, the the high water line measurement. Where is that? Uh, the setback to the road, um, as, as it relates to to the abutters or us, um, and then. We know also noticed, and and, and uh, you also mentioned that two of the two of the properties um, are now in the 250 foot uh, shoreline setback. Um, really wasn't, uh, you know, we was kind of curious about if if that's even doable. I'm sure that'll be spelled out in in the future. Um, probably the last item is. Uh, we're dealing with five properties now, and because this is not a sewer and, and public water, um, there's going to be f there's going to be five properties with five septic tanks and leach beds and and um, wells. Is are there minimum distances between leach beds, septic tanks, and and uh, the wells? Uh, that would be another thing I, w I was kind of hoping to get addressed at some point. Uh, <clears throat> um, I, I think that's probably it. Um, most of it is is in the letters that you guys have. So, I guess with that, I know, like you said, we're we're right in the you know the sketching stage of all of this, and uh, you know, a lot of this will be spelled out in the future. But uh, I know the 50 foot setback from the water's edge is into my property. And it's pretty steep right there, too. Steep enough to you have to climb on your hands and knees to climb up to almost my property line. So I hope, I know Scarborough does a really good job with not only uh, protecting the, the wetlands and the, and, the, and, the, and the people and the residents and making sure that the residents are happy with it. I, I, hope, um, I hope this holds true with the rest, rest of this project, too. So... I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, I'll close it to the public comment and open up. Sue, you want to start? Sure. 
You don't happen to have with you a sketch of what you previously proposed, do you? <coughs> okay. This was the previous one. Okay. Um, I just want to say it's true. We're very concerned about wetlands. We will make sure that any um, well or any septic system meets our standards, and we're known as, you know, the best. We do it the best here. So whatever it is, it does get decided. If it goes in, it'll be done well, and it'll be done right. So I just want to start off by saying that, okay? A um, couple of quick questions through to um, the um, remaining parcel 22.81 acres. What does that mean? That is basically open space. It's going to become open space? It's not going to be labeled remaining parcel? Correct. It'll be open space? Correct. Okay. Um, parcel to be conveyed, 2.07 acres. What is that? That is something that is not part of this project. That's a that's an abutting lot. That's not part of our. Okay, lot. I could ignore that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that basically the answer to the question that I heard you asking, which of us, which was, does there seem to be any reason to go through the process to do this? I think the answer has to come from the applicant. How much money do you want to spend? because I think there's an awful lot in this that really is not clear, and it was brought up at the beginning, the kinds of information that we're going to have to um, come up with, you know, mm -hmm. and the surveying, for example. Yeah, yeah I think that's the that's our number one priority based that's on... That's a very large issue. Yeah. What's got, what is it actually going to take to bring something in here that is not going to be um, detriment to the wetlands? I mean, that's right. pretty complex, even if we had really good uh, drawings, which Agreed. we don't have. I, so I think yeah. that this is even more than a sketch plan. This, <coughs> is, like a, this is like a prayer. Um, if you would like me to bless your prayer, I'd be very happy to do that. But I, at this point, I don't see anything that can be said other than it's very challenging, and it's right. not going to be something that you can do without a major investment. I have nothing against the concept, but I just am not convinced it's going to work here. I can't disagree with you at this point because I don't have any data to base it no, on. No, I understand, but I mean, I, I think you were just saying, do we think that this is worth it? And I think the answer is your your client has to answer whether or not they want to put what has to be put into it. And even then, no guarantees. We don't know what we're working with yet. So there's going to be Great. a bunch of money that has to be spent before we know what we're working with. Great. Okay, thank you. Before you go on, Roger. Yeah. Great. Um, just a point of clarity, um, uh, Ms. Oglis asked the question about the what's labeled on the plans that we have now, parcel to be conveyed. Um, just for, it's my understanding that that, the part, what's labeled parcel to be conveyed was part of the subject parcel um, and that was divided out within the last I guess it would be helpful for the board to understand the history because um, yeah. I don't believe that the, this split this split occurred within the last year. I believe I, it, again, it's we've been at this for a while. I sort of okay. So as I we're coming into this new, okay. that is news to me. Okay. I didn't know if if that was the case. I'm not sure why it wasn't shown as part of the subdivision prior. So we have a question. So that's an issue to, to look at and when we homework to do. Yep. I just want again, I sort of make that point for the board to understand that you know that though there are now only these two sort of fingers of access, this may have been an issue that was brought upon very recently. Right. Um, <coughs> to go along with that, Jay, uh, if I recall, wasn't there some discussions about maybe having the access road right there, or is Where? that 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 part, you know that. That parcel to be conveyed. Parcel to be conveyed, yeah. Wasn't there some discussion at one at one point? I think as I, again, we've been at this for quite a while yeah. and, and having, um, but I think that was, that this was an issue that the board sort of talked about at one of the outset meetings that to understand that there has been a recent division of property and that 
this is you know what's left is um, uh, a factor of a recent division. So though that parcel, and I believe this was in our er earliest comments, that though the parcel that's now labeled as um, I can't remember what we just labeled it as. I just flipped to away from it. To be conveyed. To be conveyed, though it's not part of the subdivision because they can do one conveyance. In terms of lot design and layout, um, it's certainly in terms of impacts on the mm -hmm. municipality, um, the board is able to sort of look at it as in, in, that, in those terms. So, um, Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to compliment the praise because <laughs> I think they've written some well, um, you know, some really well put together um, letters of concerns. So I compliment them on that. Um, I'm just on the the biggest issue. I think I think with the repositioning of the road, that removes your earlier concerns about the water running down. You know, the water issues running down the hill. Now you're worried about the water issues coming up the hill. <laughs> so. Um, and I'm not. Is that something we're going to decide, or is that going to be some other? body that's going to make a determination whether that road can go in there and meet all the, the various requirements. Yep. So the ordinance states that a road needs to be 75 foot, 75 feet from the upland edge of the of the river. Yeah. Um, and sort of to the question that was asked, it's my understanding, um, and certainly I'll ask Dan or Angela to sort of uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the upland edge of the stream of the river bed. They sort of find what that edge is, and that's where the the, the setback is measured from. So, um, that being said, the requ ordinance requires a 75-foot setback. It allows a provision for the board to reduce that to 50 feet mm -hmm. if you find there's no altern uh, no other. I, I think the language something to the effect of reasonable alternative. I believe I put it in my staff comments. Um, but but the 50-foot is the the minimum setback. And, and that includes the sort of road infrastructure, any shoulder slopes <laughs> grading that would be associated with that. Um, and so that's where I think you know the principal challenge is going to be. Um, so everything's going to really hinge at this point on the survey. Yeah, and exactly. And I think uh, just to, I don't know if this was already determined by DEP, but um, if if the Nonsuch River is classified as a river, then the wetlands are considered part of the water body in the edge and I don't know if that has been answered yet or not that's it, based on it, it hasn't and it, it it's dependent on a number of factors one is is are the wetlands in the floodplain part of the floodplain if they are then that becomes wetlands of special significance um, the other rule is are they within 25 feet of the river that's what also makes them wetlands of special significance has the DEP been out there from the files that I've seen I don't have any data to support that they've been out there or not I think further it it depends on what does our survey say because the elevations of that survey are going to dictate whether it's in the floodplain or not. Um, so all this information kind of came together today as we were going through stuff and I talked with Jay. So, you know, it's it's stuff that we had to work through to get to this point and realize, okay, this is what our next step needs to be to, m to find out if this is feasible or not feasible. Just for Mr. Chair, if you don't mind me just commenting a little bit on the stream protection district, this is different than all the other stream protection districts in town. The, the Nonsuch River is required a 250-foot stream protection district, um, <coughs> really kind of based on the prominence of the Nonsuch River and its uh, contributions to Scarborough Marsh. So even though roads are allowed within 70 f or up to as close to 75 feet and in special circumstances down to 50, uh, essentially, no development is permitted within 250 feet of the Nonsuch River. So this is um, view it as a, a challenging application in that a few lots are shown in that 250 and a road, etc. So I I just mentioned that I know that the other access point has been challenging for other reasons, you know, given public safety and its, its connection into Mitchell Hill Road. But I just wanted the board to be aware of the kind of added regulations around the Nonsuch River as opposed to other streams in town. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess it's going to be up to the applicant whether they want to in, you know, correct. commit to trying to do this, you know, yeah. or whether they want to look at that other parcel of land where 
and then I'm not sure if that's that's a viable option. Right. And we've been there. Yeah, I think it's I think it's higher and steeper. Yeah. I I have another small question, but I'm going to save that because it's a, almost irrelevant compared to what we're talking about here. So. Nick. <coughs> yeah. I. Yeah, you have to ask yourself if it's, if it's worth the fight um, at the end. I mean, I'm glad that you, the applicants made the attempt to find another way in that is less dangerous. Um, however, you've encountered more of an obstacle, I think, on on this one. So, I I don't want you know. I hate misleading people. I I'd hate to think that this this keeps going and going and going and. It's just such an unattractive site from my point of view. And that's not for me completely to determine, but uh, given all of the challenges and everything else that's going on in the site, it is really hard for me to to think at this stage that I'm going to see something that is that is really going to make me satisfied. And, and that's just being completely blunt with you and, and honest. And, I, and, and as my colleagues have pointed out, it's really up to the applicant. But... I'll try to keep an open mind as we go forward. Well, we need more data, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Mike? <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> pretty challenging. Um, I guess uh, if you remove two lots from this <laughs> small subdivision, it seems to me they would be pretty tough to make, make it economically feasible if you satisfy the setback from the river with a road. But then again, if you come back and you show us, and everyone else is convinced, of course, town staff, et cetera, that the separation from the river is um, is satisfactory, then I'll entertain it just like I would any any other uh, project. Right. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that um, what you show labeled as lot one and lot five, as they exist on this sketch plan, is unlikely, as it sits in that shoreline zone. Yeah, I think there's building envelopes on those lots, and I think there's things that we could do to to make them better. Right. But <clears throat> again, that that's to me that's the minor part of the equation. The bigger part is how does that road work, and where is the river actually in relation mm -hmm. to the property lines? That's the big question that that drives everything, in my opinion. Right, and then you know you, you talk about the hundred foot separation from Well and Leachfield, or yeah, um, but we do that on conservation subdivisions routinely, and that's usually not on something that we can't overcome. That's usually pretty easy. Yeah, in, in most in, in most layouts. Right. This, this one this one may may prove different, but yeah. the, the other <coughs> the other thing that really kind of one has to pause a little bit is when we look at the language around a conservation subdivision, I come away thinking that it's an attempt to reduce infrastructure such as roads, um, frontage to conserve you know that which we hold dear, and here we're impacting it to kind of preserve the 17 acres in the back that is really undevelopable anyway. So, I, I mean, that's yeah. just that's kind of a subjective view on my opinion. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll be looking at that too. Yeah, little argument there. But thank you, though. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna cut to the chase, Lee. Um, first of all, I know you're new to this whole situation, and I know a lot of time and expense and energy has gone into uh, the proposal. I don't take that lightly. Uh, and I have a, a, a whole host of, of questions. But I'm telling you, I think they're trying to put a round peg into a square hole. To put it bluntly, and I don't mean to minimize the significance of the depth of this, and uh, it just summarizes the comments that I've heard from my fellow board members, and I think that you know it would it's going to be a tough sell. And again, as board members have said, that's up to the applicant how much expense they want to put into this. Uh, but I think you're getting a, a pretty good flavor from myself, and I'll only speak for myself, but also from the rest of the board. Uh, and your discussions with the applicant. Uh, I just think this, this is just insurmountable. And, and yes, there are aspects of it <laughs> that, that can be overcome, but in the big picture, I think it's insurmountable. And uh, I'll leave it at that as opposed to going through the whole host of questions that I, I have. 
Yes, right. Uh, uh, Ron, um, I, I have a question on that. It, it appears to be like a right of way. That's. You know what I'm referring to? This part here? No, no. Go down further. Down, down below. Down, 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 down. down, down. down, down. Yeah, right there. Is that like a right of way? Because I was, I was wondering <laughs> whether that might be a feasible way of getting getting into that that property. You know. It's not owned by us. I know. I uh, right, I know. I but the grade is still the crest of the hill. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I don't think grade wise that. It's going to help a bit. Okay. Even if we could get. Just trying to help the guy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> He's basically a developer. Yeah. <laughs> No, we, we understand the, the yeah. challenges, and I think we need to do some more homework before we can make yeah. a decision on whether it's easy. Thank you. Anything else? Before I close, I, I also would like to uh, commend Grace for how you presented the letter. I mean, even somebody like myself understands it pretty well, and, and you're concerned that it's well written, so I don't want you to think that your time uh, was spent, you know, uh, useless. It was well written. Okay, we're done. Just started. <coughs> are you ready for number 10? Mm. Lee, are you ready for number 10? Okay. Eric Richardson requests a sketch plan review for a four-lot residential subdivision for Heathwood Lane, Assessor's Map, R14, Lot 22K. Jay? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, uh, this is a sketch plan for a subdivision in the RF District. The property is also in the Aquifer Protection Overlay District. Um, I think the, the principal item, as referenced in the applicant's uh, letter uh, for for consideration of the staff, uh, or from sorry, of the board sketch plan, is uh, access considerations to the site in terms of understanding or in terms of uh, prior approvals by the board and conditions of approval. The site uh, was originally approved for subdivision in, in 1998 with an amendment in 2000, and then the subject parcel that we're, the applicant's looking at today was subject to the third amended approval in 2012. In 2000 and 2012, the prior boards uh, had a condition of approval, which is on the approved plans, that all subdivision lots shall be accessed from the subdivision road labeled Heathwood Lane. As staff noted in our, our comments, Past board decisions don't necessarily bind the board's current consideration of the town standards, but certainly um, understanding the history and context which those conditions were made um, probably would be a relevant to the board's discussion and consideration moving forward. To that end, as I noted, this is a uh, proposal in the RF district which requires conservation subdivision design. One of the provisions of the conservation subdivision design is that there be no alteration or impacts to wetlands unless the board finds there's no reasonable alternative. Um, so to that end, um, essentially what the board is sort of being asked to config consider is if the uh, current configuration of the remaining lands proposed to be um, subdivided uh, as a result of the previous subdivision, amounts to was a reasonable rationale to en uh, enable the wetlands alterations. Um, I think that's the, the sort of uh, the crux of the conversation. Certainly I, I flagged a number of other co uh, elements on here for board consideration. Um, but I think at this point I'll leave it with that and, and be happy to answer any further questions as this goes along, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now I'll open it up to the applicant. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, this is a unique situation in that a lot of times when lots are split off they're you know the minimum size are slightly above the minimum size in this case we're talking about a lot after it was amended in 2012 that is still almost 10 acres in size um, I believe that's what makes it unique um, yes there's some wetlands on the site but you know applying what um, conservation subdivision rules to it you know it nets out at, at four potential lots
we're talking about the pot potential addition of a 775 foot long road <coughs> um, through wetland area that would be an impact of 2,686 square feet, which is less than the 4,300 square feet that requires a permit. Um, our research shows that there were no wetland impacts associated with the original subdivision. So it's something we started looking at and started playing around with, and, and this is what we came up with instead of, you know, one lot with access off of Heathwood, does it make sense to separate it into its own little subdivision with the lot standing on its own? So we're looking again for feedback from the board as to whether this is something that the board would entertain or not. Um, and with that, turn it back and, and look for any direction you might have. Yes, Nick, question. you want to start with you this time? Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Uh, Sue, you have a question I, I don't remember. Can someone tell me why was the original um, layout all subdivision lots shall be accessed from the subdivision road labeled Heathwood Lane? There must have been a reason why that was put in there, and I don't remember it. Does anybody have any historical? That was going to be my first question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there, I, we, do, you, do you remember? I. I think what well, we first, what was the original sort of, what did it look like? Yes, I, can, I can walk you through what it was. Yeah, do please. Okay, so the original parcel plan was this, like this. These lots here were split, we're split off, off. Long, long before and not considered part of the subject. Okay, what I'm looking at is two, three, and five. Yeah, okay, I'm with you. Uh, First approval in approximately 200 feet. Ability to ability to lot one, two, and three. I think at that time also lot five. So there's four lots that were associated with that first approval in, in 1998. Road was then extended approximately um, <coughs> 500 feet. We get lot six, seven, eight, nine, and then this giant lot four. Uh -huh. In 2012, lot four was split right about me here, house still here. There was an easement given to the rest of the property. An easement? Correct. Right along the back of the what it, For what purpose? Access. Okay. So that was how they got access and, and met that all Eastwood Lane. So the question is to you guys. Does, is that whole because that was part of the original subdivision, or can this lot really be standing on its own and gain access to the road up through here and, and do a development? And it's unique because there's not many lots that are that size, and that's what makes it, to me, look like it, it could be done. I don't want to hijack um, <coughs> Sue's time. No, go for it. But. Uh, I think it's important that if we if we try to wrap our arms around why that was put in there, we have to really understand it was put in there in 2000, mm -hmm. long before that lot was split and this easement was created to access the back 10 acres. Correct. So it didn't look anything like it does now. Correct. Correct. It had frontage off of Heathwood Lane. You, you are correct. There's some history here that is important to this, I think. I, I say I think because I don't know it. But there's a reason why this happened. And I don't have, I need to understand what's going on here. I mean, yes, it makes sense that we can say this is a separate subdivision. But there was a reason why it was part of this original subdivision. I don't get it. I, I don't get it. You, the only thing I can see in, in talking with Jay is that Supposedly, at one point, they said that, that the soil back there wasn't good enough to support more septic systems. My research shows that that soil is actually hydraulic group A soils, which are very good soils, which would support septic right. systems. So that part didn't wash with me. So I didn't, I, I'm with you. I don't understand why. And that's when I look at it, just looking at it, put my blinders on, look at it. I don't understand why that light can't okay. sit on. Wait, wait, but uh, somebody. Wait, 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 right next to you. Somebody had to put in, just to follow up, so the fact that I hear what you're saying, 
and this preceded my time too, but it, we were told in, in looking back in, in the, the minutes that that soil, that the soil surveys in, in nitrate plume analysis identified the land is not being suitable. And I mean, somebody, a professional had to say back then that it wasn't suitable. You're saying it is suitable. Well, what, on what I'm basis? saying based, based on what I can see from from NRCS soil mapping that it, it looks like it is. I did not see any of that documentation that said it. It was something that Jay brought up as part of the file. Or I'm not sure part of the minutes. I'm not sure where, where it came from. Any sure. Um, yeah, just when when this did come before us, where there wasn't much history given or context to the overall subdivision, where, where you know the plan provided only shows sort of the one subject parcel and not the overall subdivision step. I did a little research, pulled out the, the prior approvals and provided those to the board on Dropbox, and I did do a little bit of minutes digging. I didn't go too deep, but going back to the '98 approval, I, I sort of it was interesting to note that with the or 2000 approval, I suppose it was, that there was a, a right-of-way or a paper street right-of-way provided access to the, I'll call it to the, let's see, which should that be, yep, headed towards the west. Um, and so it's sort of, you know, when I saw that, I, I question why one wasn't provided then to additional uplands. And that's where in the minutes, uh, and I apologize, I don't remember if it was 98 or 2000 minutes, one of the comments was, um, the developer at the time felt that the, you know it was questionable, and he just didn't feel it was worth exploring. It, that was sort of the, the essence of the comment. But staff can certainly try to dig those minutes out um, should this application move forward. To, but hmm. I do think the question is certainly relevant to understand what that original intent was. I don't know if that clarified anything, but it's what I know. So you want to continue, please? No, I'm I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. I am, um, there's just an awful lot of stuff going on here and I, you know, I need to understand what we're working with more than I do t right now. So thank you. Um, oh, thanks. Um, if you think the soils are good, would it make sense to prove it? <laughs> no, well, yeah. would you say prove it? Prove, prove it. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we want. Uh, but would it make sense for the, for the road to go up know where it was originally thought it would go that right you know you said it was like a right of way no the right of way is this way. Oh, that yeah but well, didn't he didn't the original yes, developer he think about going to the to the right he did not oh he didn't okay he did not well I, don't know, I was confused looking at this also and <laughs> I couldn't figure out and I, I I certainly wasn't doing any of this stuff back in 98 so I'll pass this on to Nick. <laughs> okay, well, sometimes a lack of historical perspective can help you. Am I at all bothered by what you've just shown me, making this 10-acre parcel into four lots? And my answer to that is no. I don't have a problem with what I see here. I agree knowing some of the historical significance as to why we would have requested a road going around back or anything might have been important. But from what I can see now, I think, I think it's it's perfectly reasonable if you're closing up. I imagine you yeah. have their permission, the walker we, driveway. We would. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> in concept. We would certainly sit and talk with them and make sure that was okay. That would, yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. You that. Yeah. <laughs> Since you wouldn't want a new road right next to their existing right. driveway. So uh, there's one, one loose end that would have to be tied yeah. off. But, um, you, you know, in concept, from what I can see here, there's, other than that some vague history to be applied to it. And I don't see any problems with what I'm looking at. That's my two cents on your sketch plan. I would basically, I would agree with Nick on that. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, I, I may have been on the board at the time. You were. I saw a signature that looked like yours on the <laughs> plan. <laughs> it probably wasn't my comp. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it could have been as simple as I know, I know, Back then, as I'm, I'm sure we pay attention to it now, we really didn't enjoy creating too many curb cuts on what we mm. think of as major roads, if you will. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it could have been as simple as that. I don't know. Um, what is the grade like going down uh, Beach Ridge Road? It's very flat right there. Okay. So it could have been something as simple as that. Um, 
As far as the layout goes, there's nothing that jumps out at me. Maybe one or two things, uh, the hammerhead and how you access lot three and two. Uh, I know uh, we've heard that uh, Public Works either doesn't like or even we don't allow any driveways off the hammerhead itself, I believe. Yep. So um, that might have to be <coughs> worked a little bit. Yep. Um, <coughs> The wetlands impact, uh, like you say, it's uh, below the threshold. Doesn't seem to be too much of an impact there. The uh, the Walker residents, now, they're not owners of this proposed lot, is are they? No. And you? They they own what is lot five. Hmm. Right. Yeah. It, and that's already been improved. Improved, right? That's correct. That was the ninety-eight. So. Uh, have you you must have had discussions with them to show that they're they're willing to relocate the driver? No, I mean we are so conceptual we haven't yet. Oh, okay. We wanted to make sure that. Well, they might be watching. They might say, "What the heck is going yeah, on?" Yeah, they would be very <laughs> very high on the list to go talk to. If if, right. the, I mean, but, but honestly, when you propose something like this, is it is it so wacky that you guys just said, "There's no well, way, and you're ever going to do this and go away. Don't bother me with this anymore." Sure. I, I think that's a positive a attribute though of this of this concept. You know, to remove a driveway off Beach Ridge and put it on an inland yeah. road is, is certainly a good thing. So, uh, I think uh, there's a lot here that I would uh, I would say you should move forward and explore further. I'd like to see it again, more refined. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Okay. Um, I just have a few comments that I think need to be addressed that came from staff. One is the uh, Net residential calculation. There's some discrepancy there. There, there is, and uh, it's a it's an interesting discussion that Jay and I had earlier today. Based on how you do the calculation, even using their numbers and how you divide out to get the number of lots, I do it the way I do it with all the other projects, and I get that you could get 14 lots out here. And Jay and I had the discussion, and it's something I know that uh, he's looking into. Okay, well, that's for another discussion on the other day. Um, we talked about the wetland alterations, the discrepancy uh, the, about the soil, um, stormwater impact. Um, I don't know if you've addressed that yet, especially as it impacts the properties along Otto Woods Road. It's uh, something Jay and I talked about, and I'm sure if this was to move forward that we would uh, make that very, the outcome positive for, for those people, understanding what has been going on, and that there's been some flooding since this subdivision was constructed. I'm sure there's things that we could do <coughs> to control stormwater to make that situation much better. Well, as of right now, um, I guess my recommendation would be to continue to pursue this, but there are obstacles that need yep. to, uh, some, some serious obstacles that need to be addressed right. before, I, you know, I would be in a position to give my thumbs right. up. I, I think the, the biggest things are, are redelineating wetlands currently and doing some soil tests to see if the, that actually is going to fly. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other comments from the board? Enough right. on this one? Yep. Good. Are you going home I, now? No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for the next one? It was worth it. It was worth a try. I kept looking around for You've been a busy man. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How come these maps all look alike? <laughs> They're all four lot subdivision. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Item number 11, Brown Hill Realty, LLC, request sketch plan review for four Brown Hill Lane assessors map R35, lot 12. Jay? <laughs> yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's see, as board members may recall, this item was actually before you for preliminary approval on October 26, at which time the applicant requested be tabled based on staff and peer reviewer comments. So this is a, another one that's taking sort of the circuitous route through our review process where there was a formal submission but we're going back towards sketch plan which seems to make the most sense in light of comments. So um, 
So the applicant, again, having received staff comments, um, made some adjustments to their plans and submitted a letter really addressing four um, principal issues in, in staff's prior round of comments, and that's really what uh, staff's comments on, on this submission focused on. Um, the principal issue, um, I think, to, to flag for board members have to do with the crossing of the uh, Redbrook. As board members will note, uh, Redbrook is one of the town's two urban impaired streams. Um, and as such, actually back in uh, 2011, the town drafted and adopted a, a watershed management plan for the Redbrook, which is aimed at restoring the health of the watershed. Um, and so in terms of the um, proposed crossing, there's actually an existing crossing that has two culverts. The applicant is proposing to add a, a third culvert. Um, however, based on other projects the town's working on in the area um, and other uh, replacements that we've been doing, uh, we're staffs encouraging the applicant to really take a look at one uh, larger open structure which would be embedded in the stream. Uh, which we believe would provide uh, more adequate flow and eliminate uh, potential obstructions that the three culverts would create um, within the sensitive environment and uh, further the goals of the watershed management plan and to improve the, the habitat. Um, and so we think that's an important issue for the applicant to continue to consider. Um, it may uh, merit having uh, the board consider having an environmental assessment or uh, peer review of their proposed stream crossing. Um, let's see, other issues that were previously flagged. Um, it w previously, or it's still unknown as to when the wetlands were delineated on the site. Um, and, and actually, this is a project given the sensitivity of Red Brook and the proposed development that um, we actually flagged that the comprehensive plan has an objective to ensure that or to seeks to have uh, peer reviews conducted of wetland delineations um, and we think that this would be a, a pretty good uh, candidate for that. Um, we'll note that the applicant did have a have someone go out and provide a letter uh, dated October 27th which did recognize a, or, or did identify a previously unrecognized tributary stream on the property um, which actually raised a couple of additional questions that weren't in our prior comments with regards to um, how, how the tributary stream or lands um, were considered as part of the net residential calculation, if any wetland study or delineation was actually done on area to the east of the, which is really shown as a page break um, and is better depicted um, on the plan <laughs> set in front of you. Um, those are sort of the big ones. If, let's see, just a couple other notes that we had in terms of that now um, now identified unnamed tributary stream. Typically, a 75-foot setback is required, um, recognizing that there are provisions which folks can go to the state to receive um, reductions. But we sort of wonder why, given the sensitivity, um, that you know why they didn't consider carrying that full 75-foot setback where it would seem the the lot sizes may allow for that. And then finally, there's still not quite clarity around what the applicant's intent for the road is, whether it's to remain private or public. Either way, there seems to still be a host of waivers that are going to be required, and I think the applicant underst 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 well understands that uh, any waiver requirements uh, will need to be fully articulated and, and rationalized for board consideration moving forward. Um, so as I said, those are the four elements that the applicant had flagged in their letter and to which we responded. Back I turn you. back to you, Mr. Chair. Great. The applicant. Thank you. Um, just go, I'm going to hit all four of those items, see if we can go through and, and do the best I can to explain the reasonings behind what we've done and, and where we're headed with them. Um, first of all, with the, the peer review of the wetlands. It was found out after we submitted this, um, we were able to track down the original surveyor and wetland delineator. It was Dale Brewer, done circa 2000, 2002-ish, somewhere in there. Um, Jim Logan from Al Frick and Associates went out there with our AutoCAD file downloaded to his GPS, walked this area, and was actually <coughs> able to find some of the old flags, and agreed with 
the delineation is shown on the plan. Um, there was some question over that stream from before. Um, Jim made it very clear that it is definitely a stream, and we have since adjusted the plan as to what we submitted for a sketch plan from what we had previously proposed and pushing the lots along this edge here further away from the wetlands so that um, we are further than 25 feet, which is the requirement for the state DEP. I believe the closest our building setback can be is in the neighborhood of 45 to 50 feet uh, away from that area. So we did kind of shift and kind of push everything and, and move the road down and, and shrink the lots a little bit um, in recognition that in fact that there is a, a stream there. Um, the question to access the rear part of the lot, which means crossing right here. The, if you hug to the this far side right here, um, I think that back. Kind of right in the middle. You can minimize the stream crossing. It, it's a relatively simple permitting process to access across the stream. Um, it's actually some good land there, and if it weren't for the matter of the length of road, that would be you know some prime development area that we would have looked into with a relatively simple stream crossing permit. Permit by rule is a kind of a streamlined permitting process. It's only a two-week turnaround, so you know we think it's pretty easy and in, in this case um, you know it, it's not as big as Red Brook it's it's a smaller stream and we think it we could have easily gotten across there if you know it made financial sense to build the road all the way back there so we think that land isn't isolated we think it's large enough that it should be counted towards our, our net residential density um, as for the status of the road um, in discussions with the developer the road is intended to be private um, at one point, there was some discussions about maybe extending an arm of that off to the back of this land and, and coming down and extending across some other property to, to eventually get out to New Road. That idea has been thrown out the window. He wants this to remain private. Um, so we would be asking for a waiver, and I, I believe we've discussed this at previous meetings, to reduce the road width from 24 feet to 22 feet. Um, it's a private road. The developer is intending to pave it. Um, also intending to have two-foot shoulders on either side. And that pretty much lines up with the existing uh, culvert crossing, which is our, our fourth and final issue that to talk about and probably the, the most important um, for the developer. Currently, there's two 42-inch culverts that were installed there. That crossing is right here. Okay. <coughs> Those culverts um, were inspected. Um, Angela has been out there. Um, Mike Shaw from Public Works is out there. Um, they are probably 12, 18 inches higher than the stream bed bottom, um, which under today's current permitting rules are too high. They should be actually buried into the stream bed to allow a natural stream bottom through those culverts. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, the big rainstorm we had, we were able to go out there and, and look at that under um, what was overall a 25-year storm, which is basically what we designed culverts for, and found that those culverts were handling the flow, but it was very close to overtopping the road. Um, with some further analysis, we looked at it. Um, we added another culvert, and they're intending to bury those. They're 42-inch culverts, so it would be three 42-inch culverts side by side, buried with natural stream bottom. Um, the question has come up of why aren't we replacing that with a box culvert? And the answer is relatively simple. It just costs a lot of money. I mean, we're looking at probably a forty to fifty thousand dollar investment to put a, a box culvert where we're looking at probably ten to fifteen thousand to reset the culverts and put in another one. I know it doesn't come down to dollars and cents, but in this case, you know, with a project of, of this this size, um, a hit of forty to fifty thousand dollars is is just not in our developer's budget. Um, so with that, I turn it back to the board and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mike, you want to start? All right. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on, the, uh, on the culvert discussion, you, you said the two, first of all, why are there two culverts in there now? I mean, what, what is built there now? There, it was a, a di uh, dirt road, and I believe it, at one point it may have been for some limited amount of logging. It was used for some storage. I think there were some thoughts back when this was permitted in 2000-ish that th there was thoughts that they were going to do a, a, a development, and then for whatever reason that didn't happen. 
um, they started, you know, these two houses were, were built. Now, when, when you say the, uh, the current culverts are uh, not set at the stream bed, they're higher than that. They are. And yet that, that rain event, um, it, the flow was such where it almost was overtopping the culverts and... Almost. It was above the culverts, but it was not over the top of the road. So why would lowering them to the stream bed improve the situation? It's more of an environmental concern to keep that natural stream bottom through the culverts to encourage, you know, passage of fish and other species to work the, their way. Then the, does that not lead you to believe that the 42-inch culvert is not enough? Right, or correct. Two, two are not enough. That's why we, we designed it and looked at it. We're now proposing three. So the third culvert would, would reduce the height yes. of the water? Yes. Is it enough to...? In, in our opinion, yes. Okay. Um, the road's going to be private. Um, again, it looks like I don't know where your driver is going to come off on the on the uh, hammerheads, but um, other than that, I don't have a lot to say at this point. Uh, you said in your uh, presentation th you were proposing the road to go from 24 to 22, but the documentation says 20. I believe it's in I believe it's incorrect. I believe it's 22. I have to ch check that. I believe. Okay. You know, I, I it, one of these three projects, I'm sure 22 is right. Full <laughs> 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 dark. This one says 20. I, I'm not, yeah. not philosophically opposed to that. So, um, yes, Jay. <laughs> Chair, if I, if I might, I, just one of the things, and, and maybe Angela might be best to answer this question, but sort of one of the, the questions I heard embedded, what you were just asking, was about the flows <laughs> through the culvert. I think one of the things that's important to sort of understand is <coughs> what the impairment is that makes Red Brook an urban impaired stream. Um, it's, I think, less about flows and more about habitat. And, but again, I think I'll ask, um, maybe Angela has certainly a better sense of this than I do. Um, so if, if it's okay with the chair. Sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, I know Lee and I did talk about um, different storm events and even looking beyond the 25 year. We yeah. talked about a 50 and 100 year storm event. Yeah. So I think the flows can be accommodated. I understand that. Um, if you read through the Red Brook Watershed Management Plan though, it really gets back to habitat and fish passage and that is the impairment. And so what this does is adversely impacts the impairment that's already in the stream. So when you look at up and down that corridor, the town is putting a lot of effort into just downstream um, of installing a box culvert. Um, and I guess I would disagree a little bit with cost with Lee. I think it is going to be more expensive. I agree with that, but not maybe to the magnitude. Um, I think also in the corridor we're looking at other proposals that the board will see shortly where they are proposing um, arch culverts. Um, there are other avenues that you can look at that would eliminate the obstructions. When you're talking about three culverts, you're talking about basically two barriers in between there that definitely um, impacts what the town is trying to achieve and that is, is opening up those waterways and, um, and improving the impairment. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Jim. You all set? I am. Thank you. Nick? Thank you, Jim. Um, I, too, would be okay with the um, lessening the width of the road. And this is private. I don't have a lot to comment on. I, I do hope that there is some sort of um, mutual agreement as to what I'm hearing from the town and, and from your applicant yeah. as to to make uh, everyone happy, the town, the applicant, and the fish. And um, I think that would be that would be best to hear when you came back to us. Thank you. Okay. Much. Um, I'm pretty satisfied with everything I've heard so far, the, you know, the various comments and everything uh, regarding the culvert. It makes sense for you to do some research into that, I think, and try and satisfy us. Okay. This all <laughs> um, I don't have any problems except with, uh, again, I mean, I heard what you were saying about the culverts, but 
if there are other ways that are not going to be as expensive as the Cadillac, right? we'd like you to check into it. I'm sure you will Fair anyway. Enough. Fair enough. Okay. Um, that was very helpful. I appreciated that. I didn't realize that it was as much about habitat as it was about water quality, water quality control. So thank you for that. Um, and I really don't have any problems with the net residential um, calculation either. So um, I guess that's as far as we're going to go tonight. Okay. I, I guess I'd like to throw it back. I didn't hear anything on the wetlands and whether we thought we needed somebody else to go out there again. Oh. I was coming to that. <laughs> you go for it. I knew you would, Ron. <laughs> you address um, I think you do, particularly because of how sensitive the Red Pork situation is to the town. And I want to make sure that we in good conscience have all of the information at our fingertips <coughs> in order to make a, you know, the appropriate decision. And having a peer, peer individual go out there, uh, I think, would be necessary. And also, in light of that, one of the recommendations from the Frick Associates was a 75-foot setback, and they were questioning why, you know, that wasn't part of the proposal. So anytime you have a stream, there's a 75-foot setback. So through DEP, permit by rule, again, you're allowed to reduce that setback <coughs> to 25, showing reasonable reasons why. And, and I think we're doing that in this case, that, you know, these lots of building envelopes are getting squished, and we, we've already taken the step to squish them once um, to narrow them up. Um, I, I think it's something we can get a permit for without reducing lots any further. Okay. Um, so you brought that up in yeah. your questioning. Uh, yeah, and there had to be a reason. Yeah, certainly uh, staff agrees that getting a permit by rule to reduce a 75-foot stream setback is, is you know, the DEP gives those out. That's that's a given. Um, the question is, does the town want to hold it to a higher standard, given that this tributary stream runs directly to <coughs> Redbrook, which is an urban impaired stream? That was the reason why I flagged it. Um, I don't doubt for an instant that the PBR would be issued, since they don't even really issue it. It just sort of sits for two weeks and is accepted. So. And that was the, that was us, what I was trying to get across a couple mm -hmm. of minutes ago, the sensitivity of Red Book. And, and Jay just added to my sentiment yeah. and concern, and I, I just want that weight, and that's why I think another professional going out well, there. It seems like we've already done that. And not to be argumentative, but if Dale Brewer flagged the wetlands and we had somebody go out a month ago and look at it and agree with the delineation, yeah. is there really a need to do it a third time? my opinion, the answer is no. Anybody else on the board want to weigh in on that? Um, staff is going to... Just, just a question. I, I did ask the question. It, it wasn't clear if uh, wetlands delineation was done in that finger to the, uh, what are we, east of the... Oh, this? Yep. That, that is all upland. I can certainly have Mr. Logan provide a letter yep. saying it is. Um, he did look at it. So the, in the original wetlands delineation, you said was done in 2000 or 2002. 2000-ish, yeah. yeah. Typically, a wetlands delineation is considered viable or good for five years. Mm -hmm. um, so though Mr. Frick went out and provided, you know, a, a review. It, well, you know, I, I think, think it, I think it was more than a review because he took those lines that we had. Mm -hmm. He took in the GPS, and you can walk those exact lines, and that's where he found evidence, and he said. Based on these type of wetlands, they don't, they're not movable like, you know, a, a meandering stream is. This is a very defined stream channel. He said they haven't moved. They're the same. I completely concur with what was done years ago. Um, if, if we need to do more, let me know. But I, I think we've satisfied that. Well, I think that's something you two need to discuss. Okay, I think that can be done between staff and yeah, me. Yes, exactly. Uh, I think that's something that uh, needs to be Go ahead. I, I think we really do need the board's opinion on this because mm -hmm. staff was privy to the letter. We saw the letter. We, we, we understand Mr. Allen's position. We, in our comments, suggested that a peer review, given what the comprehensive plan 
objective is that this seems like a good alternative for it. So I think we really do need the board to give us well, guidance on it. Yeah. Sorry to Thank push you. back on you. Well, but so. <laughs> Andrew, what's your opinion on this? Um, yeah, I was the one who brought it up, I think, to begin with, when Jay and I were talking about in typically in um, some of these subdivisions with the amounts of wetland and especially looking at Redbrook, um, that I, I see this as no different uh, than any other peer review you have for architecture or even Lee's a, a professional engineer, but yet we have Wooder and Curran looking at the plans. I don't see it as much different than that. So? But if we've already had brick out there within, when was it done? I put my papers like, away. Uh, it was in October. in October. I guess I, this also, you're talking about wetland scientists, and there is some interpretation. So when we're looking at, there is, we start looking at soils and vegetation. So what is but but the state of Maine does not have any wetland scientists. That's yeah, that's a de designation from somewhere else. When we're in the middle here. When Mr. Frick went out, he went out on behalf of the applicant. It, was, it would be as if uh, the applicant provided two civil engineer review papers. We would still have Water and Kern and Angela take a look at it. Or if they, okay. so uh, just just for clarity as to as to where the the Frick letter came from. That was the yeah, May I ask a quick question? Sure. Is there one area in particular we are overly concerned about? What I'm saying is, is, is there a specific area that would alleviate your concerns that could be surveyed? Mm -hmm. Is it the 75 foot that that's the issue, or is it the entire watershed? Area? <laughs> it's a, I mean, can we limit the scope of the peer review? I mean, is that the happy compromise <clears throat> here? I mean, if you just want to make sure that that boundary line right there is going to give us the 75 feet, are we all going to walk away fairly happy? I think wetlands that are associated with streams are more sensitive than, than standalone wetlands. If you're thinking about significance, I think staff is just sort of generally recommending kind of moving forward, um, whether it's this subdivision, which hadn't been delineated for 15 years, but was recently checked up, or other subdivisions in the future, it's good to occasionally, maybe not every time, have a peer review of the wetland delineation. I think the analogy Angela was making earlier about traffic review, you know, we always have traffic peer reviewed. We always have civil engineering peer reviewed. So this one came to mind given that it had been quite some time since it was delineated um, and given the significance of Red Brook. If the board doesn't think it needs to be done, um, that's up to the board. But kind of keep in your back mind, keep in the back of your mind. It's good to do these once in a while to ensure that we're always getting, you know, um, thorough wetland delineations, and, and that can help with that um, to make sure its best practices are being used. So. I feel better. I didn't. I I missed the part completely that the uh, one by Mr. Frick was done on behalf of the applicant, and this would be peer review. I'm a big believer in peer review, and I'm a, I, I also am a great believer in setting precedent. And if our if our um, if our procedure is that it's a, a wetland delineation really is only good for what did you say? Ten, fifteen. Five, five years, okay. Then it's due for another one, and it should be done by peer review, and if that's what staff would like, I don't see any reason to not go along with it. I, I'm going to second that. I mean, we have three of our top staff right, right. here who, who, want it, it who I have a great deal of respect for, right. and they want it, and, and so I'm going to say, you know, yes, we, we want it, just to be absolutely clear and, and uh, have their input into the entire project. So... Uh, I'm going to speak on behalf of the board and say yes. Okay. I, I just want to add one more thing. The DEP was out there. They did do a, um, they, they looked at the culverts anyway as part of our permitting. So they've looked not at the whole thing, but they have looked at, at some of this and have generally been in agreement. But I understand your position too. I, I, you know, I still, based on everything that I've heard and weighing it all out, uh, we want a peer review, at least I do, and uh, uh, without it, I'm going to have a tough time getting by me. <laughs> okay? Can I be any more clear than that? Not very. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? 
I just might add, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about a peer review of Red Brook and this tributary that's on it, the all uh, The entire site. Um, I mean, you do have an interest in reducing the setback from the tributary, are you not? From 75 or? Mm -hmm. Oh, right in here? Yeah. Yeah. So I would think that, you know, if you can try to look at the effort as being uh, well worth uh, your uh, your goal, I think this would likely support no, I, you I, reducing I, that setback. I don't disagree with the peer review. I just I, no, I no, think I, I think it's going to come out and say, "Yep, yeah, it's right. we, we completely agree." And I, I just trying to avoid that. But. And, I, and I think that I'll speak for myself. I, I know I'll feel more comfortable, with, you know, uh, allowing you to get closer to that well-defined area as opposed yeah. to otherwise. Yeah, I agree with you, Mike. Okay. On that sentiment. Anything else? That. No more. I mean, we don't have any Thank more review tonight. Now it's, now it's time to go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving along. <laughs> Item number 12, is there a town planner's report? I'll defer to the planning director if there's anything to report. I should ask the answer. We do. We've been working um, on a Gorham Road preliminary design effort, um, and there was a successful first meeting three weeks ago or so. And there's a follow-up meeting if the board's interested in attending at least December 8th or 9th in the evening. Um, and that's looking at Gorham Road from the school campus essentially out to Payne Road and looking at drainage improvements, um, pavement improvements, but also uh, pedestrian um, pathway and, and bike improvements. So it's being termed kind of a complete streets effort for Gorham Road and then will likely end up being a multi-year capital project by Public Works and Angela's working hard on that initiative with Water and Currents, uh, our consulting engineer on it. Um, so if the board's interested, um, feel free to attend and we'll also update you as that design process continues. But the run on the transportation committee will be um, also up to date on that as well. And Higgins speech for, as presented earlier, a public hearing is this Wednesday, and then depending on the outcome of that, uh, council's second meeting in early December, maybe their December 2nd meeting. And I think that's, that's what I have right now. I was just going to mention we've been talking about uh, having a uh, informal workshop, I'll call it, before our next meeting, just an opportunity for board mm -hmm. members to get together and talk about, I know at, um, we've been through two recent uh, telecommunication tower facilities, so not to have an uh, in-depth workshop, but just to begin to bat some ideas and just to talk more generally about issues we're seeing. Um, and so, you know, maybe just plan to come in an hour, 45 minutes before the next meeting. It'll be, you know, pretty casual and just good, good, good for the board to get together every once in a while for a discussion. So, um, even pizza. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll take orders a little later. <laughs> Will that help attendance? <laughs> <coughs> I think that's it for town planner support, Mr. Chair. Administrative amendment report. I do not have anything to report this meeting. Correspondence. We do have a letter for the record from Mr. Price that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Any other correspondence? Planning board comments. I have one. <laughs> Just to follow up on, 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 on Dan, there was a transportation committee meeting on uh, October 27th, and we did discuss in a very preliminary way the Gorham Road uh, design, preliminary design, and uh, as, uh, as you heard, uh, there's going to be a follow-up meeting on December 8th to discuss the whole project further. Uh, we mainly talked about the Eastern Roll. Uh, Eastern Road and parking and some of the issues that are going on with the parking uh, down on, on Eastern Road and uh, are working on some proposals to make that much more efficient and also at the same time um, the owner of the property down there had some issues of how people were utilizing his property so that's being worked on and then my favorite subject is the railroad which which Angela was going to meet with the uh, 
It's becoming her favorite subject. <laughs> with with them and uh, uh, a quiet zone t type of situation <laughs> that we're working on. Uh, so, and and I I also am aware of the fact that they're starting uh, the project on Pine Point Road, the, the new uh, railroad overhead project is going to begin. So uh, that's in its beginning phases too. The railroad bridge you're referring to initially, which one is that? The one on, is that the one on Pleasant Hill Road? The, 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 the quiet zone? Yeah. No, it's on uh, Winnick Snack. Yeah. Oh, Winnick Snack. Yeah. yeah. Right. It comes through my house every two hours. Oh, right, right through my house. <laughs> so, uh, but the, so, but I've had a lot of my neighbors, and all kidding aside, on on, on talk to me. Uh, anything else? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? You do, sir. Second. All in favor? We are adjourned. Well <laughs> 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 asleep. <laughs>